host, Sabrina Salvati. All right, all right. Happy Thursday, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Savvy Sab's podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. My special guest tonight is Marcel Dixon. He is running against Representative Jim Clyburn for Congress. Welcome back, Marcel. Sabrina, thank you for having me back. So you actually made a big announcement. I want to share this with everyone. I saw your tweet here or your post. I don't know what we're calling it these days since it's no longer Twitter. But you said, as I have always said, it is policy always, party never. My original purpose for running with the Democratic Party was to hold them accountable from within. Seeing how they get 85 to 90 percent of the black vote but have utterly failed and betrayed us. I believe I made that message clear. This year, I will be running under the United Citizens Party. As we know, third parties tend to get very little traction or attention, but the United Citizens Party has been welcoming towards me and my platform. I'm excited to be joining them this year. So Marcel, I was very happy to hear your announcement. (laughs) I said, yes, <laughs> another one, but explain to people, uh, why did you decide to, you know, ultimately in the end, because I know you've run as a Democrat before, why did you decide ultimately this time around to pursue running as a third party candidate? Well, the first reason is because of fearness. I believe I wasn't from the last, my experience running with the South Carolina Democratic Party, I realized I was never going to get a fair shot with them. Now, Defeating someone like James Clyburn, who is not just any Democrat, but is one of the most powerful Democrats in the National Democratic Party, one of the most powerful politicians in America, that's an uphill battle. I understand that. But last time I ran, there will be opportunities for advertisement that will not be shared with me and the other candidate who is running against James Clyburn. For example, during one of the conventions, there were brochures and you open the brochure, it looked like James Clyburn might as well said it was the James Clyburn magazine. The other candidate informed me that he asked to be featured in that brochure, and he was told by the South Carolina Democratic Party that they would get back to him, and of course, they never did. Okay? The chairman, the then chairman of the South Carolina Democratic Party, he would attend meetings with posters pretty much endorsing James Clyburn's platform. Now, I paid my party dues, as did the other candidate. As a chairman, he is supposed to be neutral in the race. And yet he would show up pretty much with James Clyburn's posters behind him. And then when James Clyburn had his famous, I should say infamous fish fry, he called James Clyburn his daddy. Kind of weird, but that's exactly what happened. So that was the one reason. James Clyburn's daughter is the director of the political party. Now, remember when Stacey Abrams ran for governor of Georgia and Brian Kemp was the secretary of state? And remember, you could hear the Democrats scream 24-7 about fairness. That's unethical. Yet they had nothing to say about James Clyburn's daughter being the director of political affairs of the party for the South Carolina Democratic Party when James Clyburn is a candidate running for election. So it was a double standard. It was a lot of hypocrisy. The second reason is how dogmatic they were in that party. A lot of people on the left, and I don't like to use the terms left and right because it really is a unity party, but a lot of people on the left like to talk about people on the right are very dogmatic. If you don't agree with them, they will they'll, you know, get out of here. They, they mark you as public enemy number one. That exists is more on the left, okay? If you disagree with them to any extent, you are seen as a threat to the party while they brag about being a big umbrella. The Republicans don't brag about being a big umbrella. They kind of admit that, yeah, we're dogmatic. If you don't think like us, we want you out of here. The Democrats say they are a big umbrella and they're welcoming the people of different ideologies. That I found to be a lie. And my main ideology was telling them they have an obligation to their black voter base, the freemen, the black Americans who are descendants of the emancipated. 
Well said. I mean, we've been trying to tell people this for for quite some time. I think Marianne saw this as well uh, with the way that they treated her. RFK also saw this. That's why he's running as a as an independent. It's a mess. Uh, they basically just pick who they want in those positions. And a lot of these people have already bought their way in or they've rubbed elbows with the right people. Uh, I'm pretty sure, you know, Jim Clyburn is probably really close to Jamie Harrison, right? Oh, yes. Jamie Harrison attended James Clyburn's. I forgot the name of the James Clyburn has a program he does every year. It's called the Clyburn Associates. Jamie Harrison's alumni of that program. And of course, when Jamie Harrison ran against Lizzie Graham and had me escorted out of his little rally by the police because I asked him what was he going to do for the black American voters while he was having his rally in Orangeburg, South Carolina, one of the poorest counties in America that's 70% black, while his platform had things for the LGBTQ. I'm not against things we've done for the group, but what about the black American voters? He had me ask about James Clyburn was right there giving him his endorsement. They're extremely close. I was, that's why how Jamie Harrison ended up getting this nice job that he has. Uh -huh. There there was another woman, too. I'm not sure if she's if she was a part of FBA, but she actually um, was asking Jamie Harrison that uh, same question. She was like, what about us? What are you going to do? And he walked off the stage. That woman, FBA refers to just the lineage of those who are descendants of the emancipated, those who were emancipated from American slavery. But I do know those two, those two ladies, and they're reparationists. I will call them that. They're reparationists just like me. And he gets very nasty, very vindictive when he is confronted about the neglect of black voters. And yet, he, referring to Jamie Harrison, he is a man who uses the story of his grandparents who grew up in dire poverty they're in Orangeburg, South Carolina. He talks about the neglect they experience while he perpetuates that same neglect. Yes, he does. He also takes a lot of money from Big Pharma, too, which I think oh, yeah. is a big, you know, that can really turn voters off of Jim Clyburn, especially those that are older voters and they have to like ration their insulin. I know many people in that situation that can turn some of those people off if they just know what he's what he's saying versus what he's doing. If you're taking all that money from Big Pharma, then obviously, of course, you're going to push back against any type of expansion of Medicare, et cetera, any type of. And I, I think if more people knew where the money was coming from, if they knew who he was in bed with in reference to these lobbyists. And then we can bring in Israel into this conversation as well, because Jim Clyburn, again, he's just another one of the representatives that is a part of the Black Caucus, uh, I think still a part of the Progr Progressive Caucus in the House. But he's also uh, has an alliance uh, with I Israel. We're seeing more of these politicians stand up for Israel, uh, another country, but they won't stand up for people in this country. And more Americans, I think, need to start pushing back on that. I can tell you in James Clyburn's district, the voter turnout is somewhere at like 12 to 15 percent. So very few, the vast majority of people don't even come out to vote at all because they see it's either James Clyburn historically speaking, or it's another choice that they're not too enthused about. So it's usually a bad choice or an even worse choice if you can be even worse than James Clyburn, which you cannot. So most people just tend to stay home. The few people that come out to vote for him, a lot of people like to say, well, why do the black people there keep voting for him? It's not a lot of the black people voting for him. It's a lot of the white liberals who come out to vote for James Clyburn. On the matter of Israel, the same ones who, and you know, my attitude is, the needs of black Americans, freemen, will not be pushed to the back burner for any other issue like they have historically been done. We're always told, well, we got to address the issue in Ukraine first. Or oh, the issue with the Palestinians, the issue has to be addressed right now. Or oh, the issue with the people coming to the country illegally, that's the most important issue. You guys have to wait. I would not tolerate that. However, as you saw what happened in Charleston when so, so well, so Joe Crow Biden was in the church and the there were some protesters there who were simply saying that the genocide in Palestine has to stop. People started chanting four more years. Those are the type of people who come out to vote for James Clyburn. The one who knows that it's James Clyburn's district, okay, has the worst water quality in America, highest eviction rate in America is the sixth 
poorest district in the United States of America, which has 435 districts total. The same ones, the small contingency that comes out to vote for them are the same ones who are fine with seeing a genocide and having no issues against it. And Sappy, let me tell you why. James Baldwin said, if they come for you in the morning, they'll be coming for me that night. What they do to black Americans and are done to us historically and are still doing to us, they're going to eventually do to everyone. We have been victims of a genocide and we still are in many ways. So when people say they can't believe this country is sitting back supporting it, why can't you? This is the same country that enslaved, raped, burnt, deprived, terrorized, and excluded us from programs that were wealth building. And we have yet to get any compensation for that. And everyone goes about day after day as if it's okay. So why are we surprised people are going about day after day as if what's being done in Palestine and other areas is perfectly fine? This is a very good point, and this is something I've tried to get across to people, and we'll get to uh, your vision for a better America in just a second. But what you just said there about what this country has done, like what is hap- what they're ag- agreeing to, uh, basically in reference to the Palestinian people, how they've treated black Americans in this country, it'll eventually happen to you too. So yes. for those, especially those of you watching, like for example, poor white people, they'll come oh, yeah. for you too. They'll come for you too. So if you think about healthcare, for example, a lot of people may not realize this, but one of the reasons why we don't have healthcare for everybody in this country is because they didn't want black people to have it. It's a similar situation with social security if you're you're not aware. But what they didn't realize at that point in time is that by penalizing black people and saying, we're not gonna give everybody healthcare because we don't want black people to have it, that actually also hurt poor white people. And see, they didn't think about that at that point in time. So it'll happen to you too. I make the case to a lot of white South Carolinians who are vehemently against reparations. And I say to them, you are saying that the American government can do all of the horrors. I don't need to recount them because a lot of times they know all of the horrors and injustices they have done to black Americans. You are saying that the federal government can do all of that and never be held accountable accountable for those atrocities. I said, do you realize the message you are sending to them about what they can do to you? I said, because trust me, I said, I hear more white conservatives now complaining about the government being tyrannical, about the government not being, um, having integrity, about their vote not counting. And I am seeing at these protests about the genocide in Palestine, where a lot of white people are really being treated the way that some police officers have mistreated black Americans. And they are saying that this incorrupt. They're saying that the economy is not working for them. They're saying that they're being left behind. And I say to them, who has been saying all of these things for centuries, and you told them to stop being victims, to pull themselves up by their bootless straps. What they do to us, they will do it to you because you have allowed them to do it to us. You defended them. Well said, Marcel. And I want to bring up this here. This is on your website, Marcel's Vision for a Better America, a better deal for Black America, better transportation, better education, a better plan for thriving communities. And I want to dive into uh, your plan for Black America. It talks about uh, reparations and you go into specifics here, which I've pointed out to people as well. America has paid and continues to pay reparations every single day. They paid to Japanese Americans forced into concentration camps. They just paid it to residents of Guam who were taken as prisoners of war during World War II. They paid it to victims of the Iranian hostage raid, and they paid it to American enslavers, but not to black Americans they enslaved. They are paying it now to Native American tribes, to people exposed to radiation, and even mostly to Jews who survived the Holocaust. I want to bring this up for example as well. I'm not sure if you saw what Governor Hochul actually just did in New York, where she actually just agreed to give uh, money towards Holocaust uh, victims as well. So this is recent. This is not reparations that was given by Germany, but this is continuing on today. But the moment we say that we should have that for American descendants with slavery, all of a sudden it's no, 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 no. Uh, It needs to be for everybody or 
I don't want my money, my tax dollars going to pay towards it. But I don't hear any of those people, you know, pushing back and having that same type of, you know, animosity towards Kathy Hochul, who just is giving more money towards those that were survivors of the Holocaust. And this is not to say that they shouldn't have it. But what it is to say is that where is that for us when we're talking about for over 400 years of slavery? We're talking about free labor that happened in this country. We're talking about, you know, generations of, of black people that didn't have generational wealth to pass down to people, home ownership, land ownership. We're talking about Jim Crow. We're talking about the crime bill. We're talking about the war on drugs, redlining. It continues to go on and on and on. And so to me, I just want you to explain to people when people say they don't want their tax dollars to pay to that, what is you think the best response for that? Well, I say they just made the case for reparations. They're saying that, yes, you deserve reparations. We just don't want to pay it. So they acknowledge reparations are due. Now, as far as how to pay it, I will say to them, there's a precedent for reparations. It's being done. It's being done every single day for several Native American tribes. It's being done every single day for the downwinders. You know what, Sabi? A lot of people don't talk about the downwinders. The people who were exposed to radiation during America's era of nuclear testing, who live in the four corner states, they still get reparations every single day. And so do their children and grandchildren because supposedly they still have health ailments from the radiation poison. The, the, the downwind radiation poisoning. So it's being done every day and you don't have any issues with that. I also say that the federal government, and this is probably one of the most controversial things that I say, and yet I'm not going to stop saying it because I too perhaps used to believe this, but it's not true. And I'm not going to back down from seeing it because a lot of us have been taught wrong. The federal government does not rely on our tax dollars to generate a budget. They haven't relied on it for during now and their century and almost going on two centuries. They do not. Now that's that what they do rely upon is our participation in the economy, but not necessarily our tax dollars. But I will also say to those people, because usually what I get to is, well, what about the Irish? What about this group? What about that group? Well, they deserve reparations too, then if something's been done wrong to them. But we are talking about the freedmen. So if you can agree and you have no issues with these other groups getting what are due to them, then why is it only an issue when it's due to the freedmen? Well said, Marcel. And on that same note, I want to get your opinion about this statement that was made from uh, Coleman Hughes. Uh, he was another one uh, that opposes uh, reparations. He actually spoke uh, to a committee about this. I think this actually happened in Congress. He was on uh, a black news channel with Mark Lamont Hill a while back, and he was explaining why he's opposed to reparations. I want you to hear what he says, and I want to get your take on this. Joining me now is Coleman Hughes. He's the host of Conversations with Coleman. It's a podcast that he hosts. Coleman, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, let's get started right away with this question of uh, opposing the idea of reparations. You, you talk about it as a moral uh, mistake as well as a political mistake. What's the moral mistake here? The moral mistake is that obviously when the victims of a historical crime are still alive, there is a moral obligation of the perpetrators to pay reparations. When we're talking about, so for, for instance, it would, it would be a morally necessary, in my opinion, as I said at, at the hearing, to pay reparations for Jim Crow to survivors of the Jim Crow system. Now, on the other hand, when you're talking about the, the median black American being around you know, 35 years old or so, born in the 80s, is there a moral obligation to take money from one group of people and give it to that person for a crime that happened 200 years ago? That's a very different situation and one in which you have to consider whether it's politically wise to do that, whether it actually serves the interests of the community that is suffering from many different problems in the present that need to be solved, to frame that solution as reparations, saying essentially blaming a group, a group of people that don't feel connected to the crime because it was so long ago, right? So that's what I mean by a moral and political mistake. 
Marcel, I would like for you to chime in with your take about what he said there. This is Coleman Hughes. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but I'm familiar with him, unfortunately. But one, reparations is not something that's done based on morality. It's done based on legislative precedent. America is a nation that has done reparations many, many times. They even paid reparations to people who enslaved. Yeah. Black Americans, okay? They pay reparations to intern Japanese. Again, to several Native American tribes, the downwinders, the Iranian hostages, the people of Guam. And I'm not against any of those people getting what's due to them. Why is the only exception for the people who are descendants of the emancipated, freedmen, okay? That's number one. Reparations is a legislative precedent. Uh, number two, I get really sick and tired of people saying, well, those were the people who were actually wrong, not their descendants. That is a lie. When the Japanese, the intern Japanese were paid reparation, I was four years old. It was in 1988. The wrong that was done to them were in the 1940s. Several of them had died by that time. You know what happened? When the Civil Liberties Act, that's the act that paid reparations to the inter Japanese. They made legislation for their descendants to receive reparations in the case that some of them had died because several of them, a lot of them had died by that time. And checks did not go out until 1992. And more of them had died. The Iranian hostages, the people who were actually taken hostages, several of them were dead by the time reparations were doled out. The Native Americans today who receive reparations to their respective tribes, they are definitely not the Native Americans who were alive in the 1700s and the 1800s. Their descendants are getting paid. I already discussed the downwinders whose children and grandchildren today are getting paid. The Holocaust survivors. America does not necessarily pay reparations to Holocaust survivors, but they've done special programs for them and their descendants. Again, why is it only an exception when it comes to Black Americans, the freemen? And you know what people always leave out, um, Sabs? They always leave out that, yes, chattel slavery was one thing, but what about sharecropping? What about Jim Crow, redlining, the FHA, the FHA that targeted and destroyed black communities? Those things did not end until 1968. My great-grandmother, my dear Nana, died in 2015 at 101. I mourn her every day. She was raised by a man who was enslaved. I was 31 when she died. I lived most of my life with a woman who was raised by a man who was enslaved. So slavery was not a long time ago, and Jim Crow and redlining were damn near just yesterday. And well, I challenge you, Coleman Hughes, to a debate if you really want to have it, brother. Coleman, Coleman Hughes, I would love to see you have this debate with Marcel yeah. Dixon. Because how do you feel about people? And a number of people have told me this before. How do you feel about people like Coleman, who, from what I understand, is Afro Latino? Yes. Or, or, how do you feel about people who are not freedmen, but they're put into the spotlight to speak on these issues and they do so in such a way that is actually just going to hurt any type of, of movement that we try to build. But at the same time, they will defend Israel, which he is heavily doing, uh, basically su subscribing to Zionism, uh, working with someone like Barry Weiss. So what you can stand up and you can write these articles and you can defend the Israelis. But every time it comes to giving freedmen something in this country, you are the first one in line to say, here's why we can't do it. And we shouldn't focus on race. We should only focus on class. But it's OK for you to focus on identity when you're talking about the Israelis. And that's something I've noticed with people like him and a couple others, too, that are starting to make their, their mask is starting to fall off. But how do well, you feel? Well, about that? It's a betrayal because Coleman Hughes, who if people did not know his heritage, who I heard he's a Puerto Rican heritage, he would not be able 
to have a lot of the rights that he enjoys, if not for the fight and struggle of my ancestors, like my great grandmother. My great grandfather, Sabrina, is going to turn 100 this year. My great grand aunt, my dear aunt Rena, is going to turn 100 this year as well. If not for people like them, Coleman Hughes would not enjoy a lot of the rights and assets that he enjoys. So he benefits from the Black American struggle while at the same time condemning our continued fight for justice while he benefits from our continued fight for justice. That is number one. Number two, I dare Coleman Hughes to tell the Israelis, the Holocaust survivors, that they don't deserve a penny of reparations for the Holocaust and that they need to pay back to Germany, to Poland, to France, and the other European nations that have spent billions in reparations for them. Will Coleman Hughes ever say that? We all know he would not. So it's anti, I don't even want to call it racism. I don't even want to call it anti-blackness. This is anti-black American hatred that he indulges in because it feeds some of his base. And also, I want to talk to my fellow white Americans. First of all, there's a lot of white Americans who do support reparations. There are a lot of white Americans who are against reparations, not because of hate, but some of them have legitimate concern about things such as inflation and the debt. Those, they do exist. It is not because of hate. I've spoken to white Americans where I have that economic discussion with them. They say, you know what? That makes sense. There are white Americans out there who are absolute bigots. I'm not trying to reach them. But I do speak to some white Americans who say to me, my family came here the 1920s, the 1940s. We had nothing to do with slavery. So you are telling me that your family came here as immigrants, but you're telling a person who was a descendant of the people who were enslaved and toiled away and their labor and internet built this nation and were never given compensation by this nation, what well, we don't deserve while you came to this nation after we pretty much built it up and contributed to its wealth and to its infrastructure and to the very survival of this nation. Because Abraham Lincoln said, if not for the black freedmen soldiers, America would have fallen. And you don't ever stop to think how wrong it is to tell Americans who are here already what they don't deserve and what they do deserve while you came and benefited from their struggle and their fight. Well, I tell you one thing, I would it, I would love to see that debate between you and Coleman who I would host it right here. Right <laughs> here. I would host it. He won't, he won't do it. <laughs> oh my God, because no, these things need to be said. And I, I get tired of seeing people who, and it's usually someone in the audience who will tell me, Sabrina, that's not that person's full name. So I, I was, it was explained to me, his name is Coleman Cruz Hughes. For whatever reason, the Cruz is, is hidden. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's on purpose. Uh, yeah. But there are people that they basically, they prop up and you got to ask, why are they propped up? Right. Why would Barry Weiss prop up someone? Because he agrees with the Zionist views, right? So they prop them up. They have a black face. And so other people can point to them and say, see, this guy is black. He doesn't agree with reparations. Like this is all a, a game. May and I say something to that note? I'm so mm -hmm. sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Even during the days of slavery, there were black people who fought on the side of their enslavers. So I don't care if you get 2 million black faces to say they're against reparations. I've had some people say that. Well, I know the older black gentleman, I know he said he's against reparations. Okay, then he can sign away his check and give it to me. There were people who were enslaved who were uh, against the ab abolition of slavery. There were people doing the days of Jim Crow and redlining who thought Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a troublemaker and just need to go and sit down somewhere. So trying to use a black face and use that to kind of give some uh, to, to 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 give to use that to, to kind of give some validity to your stance against reparations, which is based on you just feeling like black Americans are not do justice. That is just not right at all. How do you feel about this concept of, you know, and I'm seeing this a lot lately where people say, you know, don't focus on race, just focus on uh, class or they, they say it as identity politics. Right. But class is also an identity. So. It seems like what they're really saying is just don't talk about race, period. <laughs> you know what's funny? You can't talk about class without talking about race. Here you go. So what's plan is that? You cannot talk about 
the, I, I hate this word, but the wealth, this terminology, but the wealth gap, you cannot talk about the wealth gap in America without talking about race. At the end of chattel slavery, you know, a lot of the white conservatives like to say, well, black people were harder working in the past and marriage rates were up. Okay. And guess how much of American wealth we owed at that time? 0.5%. So all of those, they say we just need to marry each other. I'm for black marriages. We do work hard and I believe in hard work. Okay. But we cannot out hard. We cannot hard work our way out of the hole that America did. What I say to people, if we went to the bottom of American society and that was because of our own personal failing, that that would be our own personal responsibility. But I tell white conservatives, you cannot preach to me personal responsibility while at the same time telling me the federal government has no responsibility to repair the centuries of damage they've done to us. If we were to the bottom because of our personal decisions, that would be different. We're to the bottom because of the decisions of the American government. And while the people today did not enforce slavery, the same entity, the American government, enforced it and did not protect our constitutional rights and allowed it. Well said, Marcel. What do you think? Because um, I honestly, like I've seen you on other shows as well. I think that someone like you can actually beat Jim Clyburn, especially running outside the duopoly. Uh, what do you think it will take? I mean, obviously, I know that you'll need to raise a lot of money. We all know how electoral politics works. But I mean, like in reference to reaching maybe some of those voters that you said do not come out and support Jim Clyburn, what do you think it's going to take in reference to the ground game? It takes really reaching them in their homes. And this is a 97% rural district. I'm rural. We spend a lot of our times outside of our home making long commutes. So it's very hard to reach us. We don't have a central area where we all gather. So we're outside of our homes a lot. What I've been doing is spending a lot of time trying to get the word to them. I can't afford mass millers like James Clyburn can do. He can send a mass miller out every day and just flood them with lies about how great he's been for us. Because we all know that those are lies. I cannot compete with that, and I'm not trying to compete with that. However, what I can do is have volunteers that I have who have already sent out 34,000 texts or some of that has been phone calls. Some of that has been text messages. We've already sent out close to 9,000 flyers and we're sending out more and more every day. So yes, I definitely need money. I definitely need donations. And I definitely can defeat James Clyburn. That's why he will not have debates. Someone in his camp said to me, why would he debate you? He's not trying to help give you a platform. I said, it should not be about that. It should be about debate me to prove why he deserves their vote. Should he not want to legitimately give his constituents, the, the show them, give them a chance to see why he's the better choice? No, he's really just interested in allowing people to believe that he's been good for them, which most people don't believe, but he also does not want want them to see that there are other opportunities. If I'm representing you and there's a better person out there who can do better than I, I want to prove to you that I can do better than he or her. And if I cannot, then I will want you to vote for the person that you feel is the best choice for you after you've been shown what we plan to do and what has been done and what has not been done. So people who can volunteer to send out flyers, to send out text messages, make phone calls. That's really what matters. Money is very important. You have to pay for those flyers. You have to pay for that phone bank, that text bank. And you know, if I get anywhere near Clyburn, if I really show myself to be a threat to his reelection, he's going to flood the airways with a lot of lies about me. Um, you know, that's going to come. He already has his kill file. And when I say kill file, I'm not saying he's playing this to me physically. I'm saying he already has, you know, They've done their opposition research and they're going to probably have like one of my parents or my students didn't like me crying about how I treated their child. You know, he's going to throw those type of lies out there. I already know those things are coming if I really show myself making an impact toward his reelection. But James Clyburn has an advantage because my area has been politically put to sleep. He's been our representative for 31 years. He has really not had a legitimate challenge to his reelection until recently. The, the last Republican candidate that ran against him, another black man, Duke Buckner, actually defeated him in some counties that he has historically won. So this is new for James Clyburn. However, my district has been rocked to sleep 
and it's hard trying to wake them up. Trust me, it's hard. And there's an educational gap there where people are just not even civically educated. Some people thought they can vote online. Some people think, say to me, well, there's nothing he can do. Everybody's going to lie. If he can't do anything, then he doesn't need to be getting paid. Okay? He doesn't need to be getting paid. And he can write a bill. Even if the bill, they say, well, the Republicans won't let him do anything. If you are a leader, you do what's right. If you cannot write a bill and get it passed, then you become the biggest advocate of what needs to be done for us. He can do those things and he does not. That's right. And, and one thing I will say, you know, social media can be very powerful, um, especially TikTok at this point in time. There could be a social media campaign started for people actually pressuring Jim Clyburn to debate you. The young young people are good with that kind of stuff. <laughs> they are. They are. But he, I, I don't think he will pay attention. I believe he will ignore it. And may I just say something with James Clyburn? He actually believes in reparations. He, When he first got in office, we have a group of Native Americans here in South Carolina and North Carolina called the Catawba. His first, one of his first legislative victories was doing a bill for the Catawba Native Americans, and I'm loosely quoting it, for them to get special protections, justice, recognition, and rights. I believe that's actual language from the bill for historical wrongs. He was able to get that bill passed. Until this day, he reintroduces it, because I think it has to be renewed every year, and it passes all the time. And the Catawba Native Americans, they get billions of dollars because of a reparations bill that James Clyburn wrote and sponsored. And he re, he re, and he has to sponsor it again every so often, and he does. He will not do any of that at all. You remember the elder here in my area, Hilton Head, South Carolina? I forgot mm -hmm. her name. Mrs. Wright, Ms. Josephine Wright. She died, unfortunately. Now, mm -hmm. Hilton Head Island is not in James Clyburn's district, but he is a federal representative. He was silent on that. Black land loss is at a crisis. We've lost 90% of our land. 90% of our land has been stolen. He has not written one bill about protecting us in our land, about getting us compensation for our stolen land. He can do it. And even if he put the bill forward and it failed, he can become the biggest advocate for us getting justice for our land. And he will not do it. No, he won't. There was also uh, a gentleman that approached him. I think I saw this on Professor, yeah. no, 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 uh, Black Authority Channel that approached him at the fish fry. Um, and he asked him, like, you know, can we get you to <laughs> co-sign, like push something for reparations? And they were very polite and nice to him. And his response was, why y'all keep fucking with me? That's yeah. how he talks to us. That's how he talks to us. He will never talk to a white person here inside one of the white liberals. He will never talk <laughs> to them that way. And I know people hate the term, some people hate the term illegal immigrant because they say no human being is illegal. When I use that term, I'm not calling the individual illegal. I'm referring to their status, their political status. But in any case, I, there was a town hall, and this was before people, before I had any traction. I confronted James Clyburn at a town hall, and people said that I left him speechless. He had no response for me about his failure towards us, the black Americans in his district. However, there was a woman there. She was an American. She was from Puerto Rico in American territory. And she asked him about the dreamer. His face just lit up. He has nothing but disdain for us black Americans when we come to him for our needs. There was another gentleman. I don't know if he wants me to give his name, so I will not. But he's one of my supporters. He went to James Clyburn's at the South Carolina Democratic Convention in 2023 and asked my reparations. And he asked James Clyburn, do you support him? Do you support him? James Clyburn said, hell no, it'll never happen. But this is a man who grew up underneath Jim Crow, where black Americans were told that Jim Crow would never go away. We will never have equal rights. And when we were told, hell no, we said, "Let huh, just watch me. And Jim Crow fell, on paper at least. During the days of slavery, Black Americans were told it would never happen. Slavery would never go away. And it went away. He is going to be on the side of history of telling us, again, that something we deserve that should happen will not happen. And my response to him is, watch me. That's right. I mean, also, I think I I don't I just feel like a lot of people like James Clyburn, when I look at 
uh, politicians like him, they're just, they're so just outdated. Like it, I mean, it's just retire already and <laughs> let in some, some new like energy come into Congress. I mean, it's just like, I feel like people like him are holding us back from any type of progress uh, in this country. And some of these people just need to retire. I think he needs to retire. I think Nancy Pelosi needs to retire. Like, Look, Diane Feinstein, what they this woman died in Congress. Like this, it was obvious she was already sick. She wasn't apparently aware of what was going on around her. They were telling her how to vote. And it's like they just sit there and hold up seats to protect the status quo, in my opinion. And my I my thing is I don't think we're tired enough. And I'm not trying to shift the blame from them to us. James Clyburn has failed us, absolutely. But there has to be some responsibility on us as well. And I'm not even saying, come on and vote, come on and vote. We treat voting like that's the only at the sphere of power and influence we have. We can run for office as well. The first thing that Black Americans did after the fall of slavery was run for office. James Clyburn knows this because he's a history buff and he knows this is true. South Carolina is a special state. It's the only state in America to ever have a majority black state legislator. It was the first state in America to send a black person to U.S. Congress, Joseph Rainey right there in Georgetown. If our people can do that in the 1800s, and don't get me wrong, there is still a lot of anti-Black American hate out there. But compared to what we were experiencing in the 1800s, it's a lot easier now. If our ancestors in the 1800s could run for office, some of them were functionally illiterate. Joseph Reed didn't speak English. He spoke Gullah, which is still a language that's spoken here in South Carolina along the coast. If they could run for office then and win and stand up, for their constituents and call out those evil, wicked, white supremacist bigots that they were dealing with at that time, we can do it now. So, Sabrina, I don't feel we're tired enough. Diane Feinstein, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, all of them, um, you know, and on the right, you have Mitch McConnell. They only exist, politically speaking, because we have allowed them to do so. If we really want them to be replaced, I see that people stop complaining about them and replace them. That's a good point. What about hitting the streets? Because I'm always telling people we need to hit the streets. <laughs> I'm always telling them we need to hit the streets. We need to, you know, organize within. I mean, I organize locally, but I'm like, if you guys are, are you angry enough yet? I'm like, what else needs to happen for people to come out into the streets? And I'm talking, we need what, 5%. 5% of the population to get out into the streets over all this stuff that's happening, whether it's economic issues. Some people are mad uh, in reference to the, the minimum wage or not having a living wage, the healthcare issue, just the way the country is treating all of us in general. People can't afford groceries right now. The grocery prices are continuing to increase. Like what else is it going to take for people to just say, that's it. I've had enough. And for everybody to get out into the streets. Or do you think we're not ready for that? I mean, we're not, because if we were, we would be doing it. I think <laughs> what has to happen, if you are upset and you are angry with your current representative, and by the way, I saw some fools in the comments saying, oh, the replacement theory. Well, guess what? If you have a politician who's supposed to be representing you and they're not representing the needs of your people adequately, I don't care if they're white. I don't care if they're black. I don't care what color, what ethnicity they may have. If they're not representing you adequately and you go to that ballot and none of them deserve your vote, then you stand up and you become the person that's deserving of your vote. And there are more people in this country than there are um, seats. OK, political seats. So you run for office and the people who believe in you, like you said, get organized, go out in the streets and get those votes for you. That's exactly what we need. And if the level of discontent, Congress approval rating goes between eight to 15 percent. As low as congressional approval rate is right now, I say there's definitely an appetite for us to have new people in Congress, but not just new people, better people, the best people. And I may not be one of those people. I believe I am, but I want to be one of the people who practices what they preach. So I believe not, don't sit back and just complain about them, stand up, run for office and replace them. 
Well said, Marcel. How can people support your campaign? Well, one, they can donate. And that is Marcel for Congress. I have it on my shirt here because people Marcel spelled a lot of different ways. Marcel for Congress slash donate. If they want to sign up to send out flyers, that's a very, very effective way to help people. I was in Walmart the other day and I saw one of my former colleagues. She's like, hey, I got one of your little fly thingies. I was like, what, really? And then I was in another place and they said, hey, I got one of your little flyers in the mail. So that is really effective, and people are actually recognizing me. It's a little unnerving sometimes, but people actually recognize me out in the streets and say, hey, I think I got a flyer from you with your face on it. So sign up to send out flyers, and you can do that by emailing me at info at marcelforcongress.com. That's the easiest way to do it because the link to sign up to do it, it'll be too long to put in the chat. You can sign up to make phone calls or send out text messages. Awesome. Marcel, thank you so much for coming on. And again, I would love to see you debate Coleman Hughes. <laughs> I would love to have it as well. And I'm going to tell you right now, it will never happen because they like to go on shows. And I'm not insulting Mark Lamar Hill. Mark Lamar Hill, for what I heard, held his own. And I'm sure he did. But typically speaking, they like to go on shows where they feel the person is not going to be adequately equipped or not have the background to adequately challenge them. So I doubt it will happen, but I have made the challenge if he really wants to have that debate about reparations. So, Sabrina, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Marcel. You take care. Bye. All right, Marcel. Yeah, I'm telling you guys, I really think like, come on, don't you guys think that he could actually beat if everybody heard Marcel out there speaking, don't you think that he could actually beat Jim Clyburn? So you can go to uh, marcelforcongress.com. Again, he's not running as a Democrat. He's running as a third party candidate, which is what we really root for over on this show. But yeah, something needs to change, right? Something needs to change. Let's go to a couple comments here and then we'll go into the other stories. Thank you for the super chat. Oh, no. Love you, Sabby. Thank you for dedicating your time and efforts to bring us real journalism. Oh, thank you. Although one of the stories tonight might not be real. <laughs> I don't know if the Beyonce one is real <laughs> journalism, but uh, what's up? Pastor Wheeler says run for mayor or governor of Massachusetts. Our suck. Yes, they do. They do. Shout out to the Oracle says run, Greg, Marcel, run. Uh, thank you, Roger. Yes, we don't support Dem slash GOP Marcel third or indie only. Uh, Robert says, Sabby, please introduce him to more media. Clyburn can be beat. I believe he can be beat too, especially since like his turnout is so low, right? Uh, Alma says the Tulsa race riot survivors, excuse me, survivors, survivors still haven't gotten reparations. They want us all to die out. Interesting. No, but it's true. Uh, thank you. Four, four, one, one, eight, two, five. Uh, that number is tripping me out. A Latino who who's of African descent also came here by way of global system of oppression. Thank you for that. Thank you for the super chat, Roger. 2K a week adjusted for inflation for next 250 years land back. Thank you for this as well, Roger. Grants to start our own worker co-ops tax free. Thank you, CM. Free Palestine, free Puerto Rico. We can also add free Hawaii in there too. Thank you for the super sticker, James. Thank you, David. Fry Clyburn, vote Marcel. <laughs> Fish fry Clyburn. Uh, thank you, Troy. Cheers to independent candidates. Break the chains. Agreed. Shout out to Rebecca O'Neill for becoming a savvy member. And also shout out to CM for becoming a savvy member. Let's give them a big whoop whoop. Shout out to them. Thank you, Andre. I had a heated discussion with my brother. Although he says Israel was in the wrong and committing genocide, Hamas alone bears the moral burden. Sick. Probably how Biden feels. I don't think Biden feels anything, uh, Andre. I think Biden just sees money. <laughs> and as long as he's getting donations, as long as he's fundraising, that's all he cares about. Thank you, Perry. Today, the New York Nets gave free tickets to the IDF soldiers. Boycott the Nets. Yeah. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Terrible, terrible. Let's take the comment on Rockfin and then we'll dive on in. 
All right. Thank you for the tip on Rockfin Hemp Car. I couldn't post this today on JB's channel about the transfer agreement that Edwin Black uncovered. His book on combustion engine is a must read too. It's on C-SPAN as well. Over 60,000 German Jews immigrated to Palestine during the 1930s, most under the terms of the Havar Agreement. Yes, we actually played that video on the JB and Sa Sabi show earlier today. So we did play the video. And it says, um, this made Palestine an attractive destination for middle-class Germany uh, Jews fleeing Nazi persecution from 1933 to 1939. The transfer agreement directly facilitated the immigration of 20,000 German Jewish capitalists to Palestine, together with the transfer of 8.1 million Jewish assets. Yep. Uh, actually, I believe JB actually posted that video on Twitter. So I know some of you were asking if you could have the link to that video, uh, but he did share it on Twitter. So you can just check out his Twitter account and you'll see it there. All right, let's go ahead and give a shout out to everyone who is a savvy patron. What is up, fam? Thank you so much for keeping the lights on around me in this piece. If you're interested in being a savvy patron, I have five categories, ultimate, sabinators. There's also sabsters, of course. Don't forget about those sabbies. And of course, members. All of their names are listed here. You can also see their names scrolling across the bottom of the screen there on the ticker. And I want to give a special shout out to new savvy patrons. Over here, we call them newbies. Let's give it up for M&M. &M. Yum, 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 yum. <laughs> Thought about M&Ms for a second. I haven't had those in a long time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't had a chance to do so, go ahead and smash that like button. If you're new, don't forget to like, sub, and share. And we are diving in. We have three more news stories to cover tonight. We will do call-in tonight. We're not using the call-in app. We're using Zoom. You should be able to see that link already pinned to the top of the chat. I'll explain that as we get into that. But let's go ahead and dive into the thumbnail. I think Zoom's going to be better anyway, you guys, because you don't have to wait in a call queue, you know? Like sometimes I was just like, you know, what if you're at the end of the line? <laughs> kind of sucks. All right, tonight we are discussing Beyonce is getting a lot of backlash. We'll chime into that story. What is happening in the country music world now that Beyonce has stepped in it? We're also going to discuss RFK Jr. shock CNN and a lot of people are making buzz about this interview that he had on CNN. Some people are misquoting <laughs> as well, but we'll get into that. We also, of course, Marcel Dixon was just here. He is challenging Jim Clyburn and he is running as a third party candidate. Again, I think that Clyburn can be beaten because he has low turnout. So kudos to Marcel for coming on. And we're also going to dive into the Gen Z exit alarm. There is something happening here. And I predicted this was going to happen. So let's go ahead and get into it. I predicted. Let's get into the story here about Gen Z. I've been telling you guys for quite some time that college is too expensive and that more people are refusing to, you know, inherit student loan debt. And I can't blame them. <laughs> I have student loan debt. If I could do it all over again, things would be different. But now there is new information that has been released by the Wall Street Journal about Gen Z actually choosing to abandon college altogether in trade for something else. Now, I want to start out with this clip here called Millennials and Gen Z are regretting their college degree. I want you to hear just about some of their experiences in reference to the debt that they have acquired for these degrees and just regretting it all together. Listen to this. And this is the exact reason why most young people that I know when they ask me, should I go to college and university straight out of high school? I always say no, because post-secondary education is an investment and most of you don't know yourself well enough to make that investment wisely. And ironically, you're gonna get to know yourself in the college and university setting, but you're gonna be spending tens of thousands of dollars to do it when you could be doing it somewhere else and not spending that money by simply getting a job that you don't love, but you don't hate so that you can afford to move out of your parents' place and experience the world, that will allow you that, that sense of growth and self-realization that you could have had on a college campus. And you don't have to spend all that money and time to do it. Life feels short, but realistically it's long. And as long as you're moving forward in some capacity, you're gonna get to where you wanna go. 
you don't need to figure out your career straight out the gate. What is the biggest waste of money? A four year degree. And to be honest with you, that's probably one of my biggest regrets because you spend the first two years and a lot of extra money taking courses that for a lot of people you just took in high school. And sometimes these are courses that have nothing to do with the degree that you were seeking. Pause. Yes, honey. Yes, I agree. I agree. And that was one of my biggest pet peeves. Why do you have to spend the first two years Depending on the college you go to, I think it's different for people that went to like engineering schools, like MIT is a little bit different, but that's more specialized. But for those of us that go to the typical traditional four year university, it didn't make sense to me. The first two years I had to spend taking all these core classes. And I'm like, didn't I just take these classes in high school? Why are we taking these again? And then on top of that, they're like, you can't take classes within your major until your junior year. What the fuck am I here for then? Because the way I kind of looked at it is though, instead of taking those core classes in the first two years, I could just jump right into my actual major and then it's no longer four years of college, it's just two years. That's just another way for universities to make more money. Do you really need to take algebra again? Do you really need to take US history again? Do you really need to take biology and bio lab again? No, I mean, has the science changed in reference to what a cell looks like? Think about those things. Another way for them to make money. I was an English major. I'm a finance writer. And of all the companies that I've worked with over the years as a freelancer, to my knowledge, and these are companies that pay good money, to my knowledge, only one company has ever required a degree. Most of the time, the only thing that they care about is that I know how to write and that I know about money. Looking back, I could have bypassed the entire degree and simply taken a few writing classes. What's something that's clearly a scam but Americans have been conditioned to believe is normal? Ooh, I have a good one. Telling 17 year old kids that they need to go to college if they want to be successful and then saying, oh, even if you can't afford it, no big deal. Here is a student loan for you. It's okay. You don't pay it back till you have a degree. It'll be deferred until you're out of college. Then when you get out of college, you either can't get a job in your field or the job that you can get in your field pays you $14 an hour and you can't afford the crippling student loan debt that you were encouraged to get to be able to get the degree that you don't even want because by the end of college you're so burnt out and you hate everything that you can't even use the stupid thing and you can't afford your student loan debt and then you have people saying well why do you get student loans when I went to college I worked my way through college you're just a lazy entitled brat yeah when you went to college college was $12 and a piece of toast She's right on the, the button here, right on the button. And it's also true too. This is another thing that I also had a problem with, you know, I too, and some of you, if you're in the millennial age bracket, my guidance counselors told us in high school that if we wanted to be successful, if we wanted to actually become middle class, <laughs> remember that was the thing, middle class as an adult, that we had to go to college and we had to get a degree in order to get those jobs that were going to pay uh, a middle class income, right? Boy, was that a lie. And what a failure, right? But that's what we were preached. That's what they told us, you guys. And so a lot of us believe that and we did that and we followed what our guidance counselors told us to do. And then we got out there in the real world and we're like, what? You want to pay me $9.50 an hour? My first job offer when I graduated undergrad was $8.50 an hour. I was like, are you kidding me? That's not what it's supposed to be. Is it still worth it today? So, anybody want to donate to my student loans? So, what do you do for work? Mm. So, I got my degree in behavioral analysis and the study of female whales, specifically in the Atlantic Ocean, with a specialty in plant development on the east shore of the Mississippi coast. So, what do you do with that degree? So, I actually, I sell jewelry. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It, you know, I feel like my degree really helps me with that. Are we getting degrees for nothing? No, not nothing, but degrees have less value than they did 10 years ago. The reason for it is because everything is free and learnable on the internet. Companies don't really care anymore how you got that information. They just want to know, do you have the skills we're looking for? That means if you went to a four year degree and got those skills, or if you didn't go to school and you got those skills from the internet, it's pretty much the same thing now. But where college does have the advantage is your network, some structure, just a break for four years.
A bachelor's degree in 2023 is what a high school diploma was in the 80s. You're not crazy, and you are completely correct, and it's a multitude of different reasons, primarily being something called academic inflation. What is academic inflation? Essentially, it's the increased need from employers to have higher education for positions that don't really require them. A good example of this was my mother was director of human resources and personnel for over 40, 30 years, I'm sorry with yeah. Marriott Hotels. And eventually in the early 2000s, she was forced out of her position. This is a woman who'd been general manager, a senior HR executives for years until they finally decided that they needed people with degrees. That's right. Now go ahead and uh, stop it there and we'll bring in that article. Another example that I want to give you when I graduated undergrad was Verizon, right? So there are Verizon call centers. These are pretty huge in the South. I graduated from the University of South Carolina. Verizon was one of the companies that would come to the career fairs, right? So the only requirement was that you had to have a bachelor's degree. So many of the people I know that went to work for Verizon did so not necessarily because of the pay, but because of the benefits and the perks. They were guaranteed health insurance. They also got like a discounted phone. New phones came out. They got it. They would also get bonuses and perks and things like that, yada, yada. But it's a call center. And I worked at a call center when I was in college, when I was an undergrad. I didn't have to have a bachelor's degree to do it then. So again, that was another example of a company that I felt like they made that requirement in order to weed out the number of applications, but you don't need a bachelor's degree to work at a call center, particularly Verizon. But this is the, the article that is making all the buzz, ladies and gentlemen. This is from the Wall Street Journal, how Gen Z is becoming the tool belt generation. Brace yourselves, folks. The times are changing. Let's get into it. America needs more plumbers and Gen Z is answering the call. Long beset by a labor crunch, the skilled trades are newly appealing to the youngest cohort of American workers, many of whom are choosing to leave the college path. Rising pay and new technologies in the field from welding to machine tooling are giving trade professions a facelift, helping them shed the image of being dirty, low in work. You know what, guys? For the ladies listening, you know where you can make a lot of money? Welding. Particularly if you are a female. Apparently there is a need for women welders. No kidding, guys. No kid. Growing skepticism about the return of a college education, the cost of which has soared in recent decades, is adding to their shine. Enrollment in vocational training programs is surging as overall enrollment in community college and four-year institutions has fallen. Yes, this is what I'm talking about. This is what needs to happen. If you want to make these universities lower the cost of tuition, you can continue to cancel student debt as much as you want, but if there is no accountability put on the universities and they're continue to increase tuition, nothing's going to change. You're still going to have to take out student loans, particularly if you're not coming from a wealthy family that can pay four years of tuition, right? But if enrollment is declining at these four-year institutions, then eventually they'll have no choice but to decrease the cost of tuition. I know I worked at them for over a decade. I know how the business model works. I'm telling you where they get all this money from. And one of the things they really stress and put pressure on is the enrollment numbers. So if the en enrollment numbers are not good, that's not good for the university. You have to look at it this way. The students are customers. The university is a business. It really is. So if there is a decrease in customers, the business is going to decline. They're going to take a hit. They're going to have to make adjustments in order to make a profit. That's how you make them accountable. It goes on to say here, the number of students enrolled in vocational focused community colleges rose 16% last year to its highest level since the National Student Clearinghouse began tracking such data in 2018. The ranks of students studying construction rose 23% during that time. While those in programs covering HVAC and vehicle maintenance and repair increase 7%. These are things that you may not think about if you don't need these services at 
this point in time. But at some point, you probably will. If you have a problem with your heating and air conditioning, you might need to contact someone from the HVAC. You need someone who knows how to work with that. Vehicle maintenance. I don't know how to fix a car. I don't know how to fix any of those things. Only thing I know how to do with a car is change the oil. So you're going to need someone that knows how to do that. These trades are very important. It is a really smart route for kids who want to find something and aren't gung-ho on going to college, says Tanner, who's 20, who graduated from a nine-month welding program last fall. Check it out, guys. Just imagine this could be you for the younger people watching. This could be you. Imagine if you get to weld and you can tell all your friends, check me out, guys. I got welding gear and shit. <laughs> you can get all excited about it. Watch me weld, fam. Look, they even have one there. Helmet here. It says pipe gang. Think about it. They'd originally, uh, though he'd originally figured he'd go to college, the route began to feel less appealing during the pandemic when he watched his parents, both tech workers, gaze at their computers all day and realize he didn't like the idea of spending his life seated before a screen. Let's go up here. A secure job track and the prospect of steadily growing earnings didn't hurt either. After five years at the profession, he says he expects to make six-figure annual income. Let's highlight this piece right here. After five years, he's expected to make a six-figure annual income. How many of you can say that with the current positions that you have now? I'll wait. Right. That's what I thought. So that is awesome, you guys. That is huge. Now, peep this. You don't want too many people rushing to do this at one time because here's the con about that. Certain industries can become oversaturated. And don't forget, these blue collar jobs are no different. If everybody all of a sudden starts to rush to be a construction worker or a welder or to work in plumbing, all of a sudden those fields will become oversaturated too. So we got to do this in, in some kind of way that it doesn't oversaturate that field. And then people find themselves, well, I can't get into this field anymore again. That's what happened with law. The legal profession became oversaturated and now there's online lawyers. So some people don't feel like they even need to contact a lawyer that went to law. Anyway, some of these things you can figure out for yourself online. Law became oversaturated. I remember when I lived in North Carolina, nursing became oversaturated. The teaching profession came, became oversaturated, although at the same time we're losing teachers, so it's kind of weird. But you don't want something like that to happen either. It goes on to say it feels good at the end of the day. I'm physically doing something and there's a sense of completion. Look at him smiling. Check him out. Worker shortage. There is a shortage of skilled tradespeople brought on by older electricians, plumbers and welders retire is driving up the cost of labor as many sticker shock homeowners embarking on repairs and renovations in recent years have found. This is true. The median pay for new construction hires rose to 5.1% to 48,000 over 48,000 last year. By contrast, New hires in professional services earned an annual 39520 up to 2.7% from 2022. So guys, this is great. Like I, I love seeing this because I've told you guys before, college is not for everyone. And I have gotten past the days of telling people you should go to college just because. No, you shouldn't go just because. I wish people never told that to other people either, right? You should just go just because, oh, if you don't know what you want to do, you should go to college. No, you shouldn't. Because if you don't know what you want to do when you go to college and you have to take all the student loan debt, and let's say you graduate from college and you still don't really know what you want to do. Now you got all this debt and you didn't know what you wanted to do. So what did you pay for? No. And we need to look at the economy in reference to what millennials and Gen Z are dealing with right now. Check this out. But many people are not feeling the positive vibes. I see $400 going towards my student loans, and I see $545 going for HOA, and I see groceries uh, averaging about $150 a week. Sure, maybe for my wife's uh, you know, retirement portfolio, it might be looking great, but we need to get there first, right?
On Saturday, we heard how MetLife Stadium is preparing for the World Cup final. Danny Navarro did not plan to be a TikTok creator. If FIFA decided to sell tickets for the 2026... That was not his goal. When he graduated with a history degree on a scholarship from the University of Virginia and started working at a nonprofit. I was at... Pause before he tells you his story. A couple of things I want to point out. The University of Virginia, UVA, that's a top school. It's a public school, but it's a public university that's a top school, similar to UNC Chapel Hill, also a public university, but it's a top school. That's a really good school that he went to, okay? He also had a scholarship, okay? I don't know if it was a full scholarship, but he had a scholarship. Listen to the jobs that he ended up with. Listen to this. The $60,000 mark of my salary, and the only way that I was going to crack 80, 90 potentially, was to get a grad school degree. So Danny went back to school for a master's degree in public administration. Pause. Yeah, you're right, Lyle. <laughs> Lyle said that degree was his first mistake. You're correct. So then he did what, what people will often do if you want to move up in your field, you have to have a master's degree. So he went back to school. He went to grad school. It's the same thing I had to do. And oftentimes for grad school, you do have to take out uh, student loans um, unless you get some type of a scholarship. I got a partial scholarship from Northeastern, but it wasn't much. <laughs> so I still had to take out more student loans. This time he had to take out student loans. I had to take out $70,000 in loans, which is more than what I was making. And then right off the bat, having to pay that debt down. And so it's almost like we just, we're, 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 we're basically thrown into the hole and right, right away, we have to start climbing out of it. Let's see here. That was eight years ago. And the promise that his college degrees would lead to a steady paycheck has not paid off. So you're first generation. And what was the dream for you? What was the dream if you went to college? We would escape poverty. And you know, for, for, for immigrants that are coming to this country, that's always the, the thing that they tell you. Danny now juggles three jobs, soccer coach, tutor, and TikTok video creator. I don't and that is not uncommon today. And that's what I wanted people to really see. This guy went to UVA, a top school, and he's working three jobs. I was working two jobs when I graduated from undergrad. So I know the feeling. He said he has to pay $150 a week for groceries. It looks like he's in Alexandria, Virginia. That's right outside of D.C. Alexandria, Virginia is expensive. Uh, nothing he said surprises me. <laughs> Anywhere close to D.C. costs money, okay? <laughs> Just tell yourself that. So I'm not surprised by that. But nobody goes to college so that they have to work three jobs. But here we are. I have a full-time salary job since uh, November of 2022 and it's not without trying i've tried to i've, I've actually have applied to about a hundred jobs a hundred jobs i would say about uh in the past year and, and change and a couple of them have gone into the final round but just unfortunately not been selected you want to look outside come here look outside my life is very different than what i envisioned it would be crazy Rachel Gambino and Garrett Mazio followed the roadmap that previous generations said would spell success. Go to college, get married, work hard, buy a house, start a family. This is the American dream, but it, at what cost? So we have all of those things and we appreciate every single one of those things, but we think about how we could lose those things very quickly. If mm -hmm. one of us loses our job, um, we're, we're in a not good place. Between their college debt and monthly mortgage payment, they feel they've slipped into a lower economic class than the one they grew up in. Do you describe yourself as middle class? I like to think we are. I, I uh, would say lower middle class. Why? Because when I think of middle class, I think about people who are able to just get up and go and do things within their means and like not extravagant things, but be able to get up and go to dinner whenever they want or maybe take that trip, that long weekend trip. We don't have that luxury. Rachel works at a nonprofit, Garrett as an insurance underwriter, but their paychecks barely keep pace with their $3,400 monthly mortgage payment. I was just going to chime in here and say, as soon as they said she worked at a nonprofit, I was thinking she ain't making no money. Nonprofits don't pay much. I'm not trying to be funny, but they really don't. And it's great work, though. I know a lot of people like working with nonprofits because they really want to help people, right? But 
most of the positions don't pay well. Uh, it's just the reality of the situation. And they also had a baby. Now, some people are going to see this and they're going to say, oh, well, they should have had kids. I think that's the wrong mindset. They should be able to. That's the thing, guys. You should be able to buy a house. You should be able to start a family if you want to do these things. You shouldn't have to struggle to do it. That, that's what I want us to start. When we talk about where people are financially in this country, when we talk about people make, oh, you made a bad decision, you shouldn't have gone to college, you shouldn't have done this. In the reality, in the grand scheme of things, when you talk about the American dream, you should be able to have these things. The reason why we can't is because of a lot of greed and because of the people up at the top, right? Why are these homes so expensive? Why are your grocery grocery prices so expensive? Gas. Why? Why does it cost so much money to have a baby, to physically have a baby at the hospital? These are the kind of questions that we should ask and we should never put blame on the people who are just trying to live the American dream. And basically, if you're looking at what the books tell you to do, they did everything by the book. But this is where we are now. So shout out to the Gen Z peeps who are looking to dive into blue collar work because it does pay more. And they're like, screw this. And we are about to do the damn thing. Let's go into some of the comments here. Shout out to Alfie for becoming a Sabby member. Give Alfie a big whoop whoop. And Alfie has a baby in the picture. Frank says college is a scam. Trade schools, however, are not. At least you know you can do something with the trade school degree. Troy says, I'm a millennial and never went to college because in my mind, I was like, why am I paying for an education? Wait, what? That's a good point. Thank you for the super chat, Troy. Education isn't a waste of time. Education system is. Pi says STEM or it ain't worth it. I often wonder if that's going to become oversaturated at some point too, because they're really pushing STEM, at least here in Massachusetts. Thank you, Nick. Tech companies only hire foreigners now. I don't know if I would put it that way. Um, I think they hire people who have those degrees that they're looking for and have those skills that they're looking for. And a lot of times it tends to be people that are internationals. JB says, Sabby, remember the movie Accepted with Justin Long? Yes. His dad in the movie said, if you want to be somebody, you go to college. That movie was good. That movie was hilarious. <laughs> uh, Raul says, what happened to the Afro man presidential run? I have no idea. I reached out to them uh, to try to schedule an interview. I never heard back. I don't know if anyone has interviewed him. Um, in reference to presidential run. Shout out to P. Smith for being a member for seven months. Years ago, a diploma showed you were capable of completing something and investing in yourself. They really weren't necessary otherwise. That's a good point. Uh, thank you, David. This was a South Park movie plot. Repairmen become wealthy because no one knows how to fix anything anymore. It was hilarious joining the Panderverse. Interesting. Uh, I have to check that out. Thank you, Troy. Invest in infrastructure equals more welders slash plumbers. Tia says, oh, hey, Tia says, I know MIT graduates who can't get jobs for their degrees. Yeah, man, it's wild out there. I'm telling you, it is wild in those PhD streets because some of them can't get jobs either. Uh, thank you, Juanetta. Hey, Sabby, my son got accepted at Ferris State University and Oakland. He's turning both down and he's choosing Northwestern Tech for HVAC for Havoc. Heck yeah. Tell your son I said, well done, kid. Well done. All right. Based. Making sure I got those. Did I miss one? Oh, thank you, Michael. College degrees used to mean economic security. Yeah, you're right. You are right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm trying to fix my shirt here. Thank you. Based. Let's move on, shall we? Go ahead and smash that like. We are going into this Beyonce story. I don't know how you feel about country music. I listen to all genres of music. So 
I like some country, mainly newer country, right? With the exception of that Dolly Parton song. But other than that, mainly newer country. I didn't cover the story earlier because I actually wanted to be fair and listen to the album. So Beyonce did release a country music uh, album called Cowboy Carter. And I finally got to listen to the songs on Spotify. There were two songs in particular that I, I was very fond of, uh, the Texas uh, Hold'em song, which is, I think the first single, I really liked that song. I thought it had a good beat. I was like, yeah, you know, um, and there's also a song on that album that she has with Miley Cyrus. It's a duet. I forget the name of that one. I thought I wrote it down, but I forgot. Uh, but that song's pretty cool. Uh, but overall, I will say that before we get into what happened, I think that if you're going into this with the mindset of hearing a traditional country album, that's not what you're going to hear. Some of the songs on the album don't sound like country songs. Some of the songs on the album actually have more of an indie rock uh, kind of feel. In fact, that song with Miley Cyrus, I feel like kind of has an indie rock kind of feel. Um, so just giving you a heads up about that when you go in listening to it. There's a song on the album with, um, oh, what's the girl's name? No, she's not really a song. Dolly Parton's on the song on the album briefly. Willie Nelson was on there briefly, but that was more like a, a 30 second uh, speech or something like that. Um, but there is a remake of the Beatles song Blackbird, uh, which I love that song by the Beatles. Again, that's that's not a country song. So I don't want you to think all the songs on the album are country because they're not. Uh, and some people had a problem with that. And some people had a problem with other things. So Beyonce actually did reach number one on the country music charts with Texas Hold'em, which is historic. We're going to go ahead and get into what happened after that release and why some of these country music radio stations did not want to play Beyonce's music. Oh, ho, ho, what a surprise, ladies and gentlemen. Let's dive in this here. In fact, one Oklahoma-based radio station sparked outrage this week for initially refusing to play Beyonce's new single. A fan who requested the song received an email reply that read, quote, Hi, we do not play Beyonce on KYKC as we are a country music station. Well, the station's owner later told NBC News that it was unaware Beyonce had released country songs when the request was made. But let's take a step back here for a moment. According to Forbes, as of Tuesday, only eight of the 150 stations that report to Billboard's country airplay chart reported having played Texas Hold'em in its first day. And none said they had put her other single, 16 Carriages, on the air. And this is not the first time the country music industry has been at odds with Beyonce. She faced an intense backlash in 2016 for daring to perform at the CMAs alongside the chicks. Pause. I remember watching this live. Uh, so I do remember. I don't watch award shows anymore, but I do remember seeing this. And there's a couple of things that went along here. I actually have a, a brief um uh, op-ed as uh, someone who was actually present at that event. And they're going to tell you some of the things they heard in the crowd. Uh, so Beyonce had a twofold here. Like number one, people see a black woman singing at the country music awards with country music artists, which is very strange considering that black people, country music actually started with black people. This goes to show you how much people know about the history of this country. Uh, but then also the Dixie chicks, which they changed their names to the chicks, the Dixie chicks. I told you before on this show, they were canceled, meaning that they had, uh, you know, opinions about the war in Iraq. They were not for it. Uh, they spoke out about that. And the next thing I knew, the Dixie Chicks were done. I mean, these women couldn't get a venue for like 10 years. So when I say they were canceled, they were really canceled. So there's that too. Uh, but there's a lot going on here that I'm going to dive into as well. Uh, but I just wanted to, you to really hear that part because I want you to understand that it's not like this was Beyonce's first time being introduced to the country music industry. She did have this performance with the Dixie Chicks at the CMAs in 2016. Let's be very clear here. This is just the very latest flashpoint 
of the long and ugly history of racism within the country music establishment. You're probably familiar with some recent episodes, like when rapper Lil Nas X saw his viral hit Old Town Road removed from Billboard's Hot Country songs on the grounds that it, quote, did not embrace enough elements of today's country music. And there have been even more foul uh, and even more outrageous controversies after it was reported in 2021 that country superstar Morgan Wallen was caught yelling the N-word on camera. He immediately saw a 1,200 percent increase in digital album sales. And just Pause for a second. So this part right here, another thing that I want to mention, is this to say that this only happens in country music? Someone yells the N-word or whatever, or artist yells the N-word? No. <laughs> no, it's not. But it seems to only make headlines when it happens in country music. So just keep that in mind. A 1,200% increase in digital album sales. And just last year, Jason Aldean filmed a music video for his infamous grievance anthem decrying Black Lives Matter outside a Tennessee courthouse where a black man was attacked by a mob and lynched in 1927. For years, for decades really, white country music fans have sent a clear message. Black artists do not belong in this genre, which is racist, obviously, but also ironic given how musicologists speculate that the precursor to the banjo, the cornerstone of country music, originated in Africa and arrived on American shores during the 17th century with Exactly. See, this is the part that people don't know the history. And it's not just country music, rock and roll. Where do you think that came from? Who do you think started that? You think it was Elvis Presley? <laughs> Elvis stole from everybody. <laughs> everybody. <laughs> now, Beyonce steals from people too. <laughs> That's the other thing. This is something that has continued uh, to happen throughout the music industry. But yeah, a lot of people just don't know the history. Uh, country music, unlike the other genres, does tend to be more conservative. And you're going to see examples of that, not just with Beyonce, but there's a couple other artists I want to show you further along as well that have also received pretty bad backlash. Slave people taken from West and Central Africa. According to Alice Randall, professor of African-American studies at Vanderbilt University, black country music goes back to the arrival of the first black child to an enslaved African woman in the yep. Americas. Black people have always been a part of folk and country music. Ray Charles, Tracy Chapman, Charlie Pride, Darius Rucker. And to the conservatives who claim that Beyonce is stealing your genre, you're making her point for her. This new album, Act Two, is the second installment of a three-volume project that is literally about reclaiming black roots in musical genres that have been co-opted and whitewashed. So do yourself a favor. Go listen to Texas Hold'em. It's good country music, and to anyone who says otherwise, well, bless your heart. So that was I'm in there from MSNBC. Again, like I said, I didn't want to talk about this until I actually listened to the album. And I'm, I'm here to tell you again, not all of the songs on the album are country songs. Some of them do have more of an indie rock feel. Uh, but there were a couple of songs on the album that I did like. Uh, now, I want to get to this segment here because... It wasn't just about the backlash from the radio station that she received, but one of the things that is also highlighted is the fact that she did give credit to other people in the industry. And I think that's important to other artists that you may not have been familiar with. Let's dive into this part here. Last week, B B B Beyonce became the first black woman to top Billboard's hot country chart and got the stamp of approval from the queen of country music herself, the great Dolly Parton for that's because Dolly Parton is a real one. <laughs> All the people that are hating, Dolly Parton is a real one, right? And she faced her own issues when she first started in country music as well, right? But she's, she's pretty as real as they get. Doing so. The most Grammy winning, winning artist in history knows how to knock down barriers for herself. But Beyonce is also giving some deserved shine to other black country and folk artists like Rhiannon Giddens, who plays banjo on Texas Hold'em. Giddens wrote about the black roots of country music this week, reminding us enslaved people of the African diaspora created the banjo in the Caribbean in the 1600s. This is historical fact. 
The hype around Bay's new single is also amplifying the many Black artists already in country music. It's the Beyonce boost in streams for Black women country artists, including a 275% increase. Wow. For a pioneer of the genre, Linda Martell, the first Black woman artist to play the Grand Ole Opry back in 1969. I'm joined now by songwriter and producer Alice Randall, the first black woman to co-write a number one country single and the author of the upcoming book, Memoir, the upcoming memoir, My Black Country, which also has a companion album. It is so great to talk with you, Alice Randall. And so I just want to start by getting your take on all of the sort of contretemps <laughs> around Beyonce charting in country. I have to play this. This is John Schneider. He used to be on a show that used to glorify the Confederate flag on a car. Here he is. He's, by the way, he's from New York. But here he is. Oh, let me cut that part. I forgot it plays that part. Oh, yeah, she didn't play it. Um, so the name of the show, ah, uh, the name of the show, they messed up that clip. I forgot. The name of the show was called the Dukes of Hazard. I don't know why she didn't just say the Dukes of Hazard show, <laughs> but yeah, he, he said something uh, negative about it. But of course, like why are, are, are my surprise here? Now, let me bring up something else really quick before I bring up some of the other women that she included to be a part of this album who are also country, country musicians. They're black women, country musicians, but you probably have not heard of them. Let's not get it twisted. This is not to say that Beyonce is not talented. She is incredibly talented. But had it not been for who she is and how famous she is, would she, anyone else that just started in the country music industry, black woman, would they have shot to number one like that? Probably not. You know, it's different when you're Beyonce and you say, I have a new album. Oh, and it's a country album. You already have a fan base. So people are going to at least try to check it out and hear what it sounds like. So Beyonce did have an edge that these women that you're going to hear from that are included to be part of the album did not have because they did not have name recognition. So when you have name recognition and you do that type of switch, you know, Justin Timberlake did this too. At one point he switched over to country. I don't know what happened to him. But he tried that one time. Uh, other people have tried to pivot. You know, I think Kid Rock at one point, he started off as rap slash rock and then he moved over to the country with Sheryl Crow kind or whatever. You know, people have done those things. But I think when you already have that name recognition, it is going to be a little bit easier for you than it would for these women right here. But it was nice of Beyonce to include them on the song Blackbird. I want you to hear what they had to say. Mm. It's really special. Um, you know, I, I honestly didn't know the, the importance of that song until after we recorded it. Um, and so it just made it that more special. Um, and all of us girls, we were texting this morning just about how how fun it's been and, and how cool it is that we get to experience this together. So these women, the women that you see here on this picture, so Tierra Kennedy, Tanner Adele, Brittany Spencer, and Raina Roberts, they all sang uh, on the song A Blackbird, the remake of Blackbird with Beyonce. These were already women that sang in country music. You probably just never heard of them because they don't have the name recognition. So there are black singers in the country music business. I, I don't want you to think there aren't, <laughs> right? So again, it's just, you know, you got to hear from, from these people sometimes. You got to hear from the people that are not big names, the people you may not know about. About how, how fun it's been and, and how cool it is that we get to experience this together. Um, this is such an important song, and I'm so thankful to Beyonce for including us. Um, and I think that it's spreading such a, a special message to the world and hopefully to young girls that want to get into country music one day. Yeah, Paul McCartney wrote that song back in the 60s for the Beatles, um, and he wrote it not about a black bird, but a black woman in the context of the civil rights uh, movement. And then Beyonce now has a cover of it. Uh, Holly, let me come to you. I learned from you uh, when we spoke a year ago about. Just wanted you to hear that part there. And then I want to bring up something else because we're going to get to this issue, a couple of issues that people had with Beyonce uh, entering the country music scene. One was uh, 
her attire, the way that she's dressed, they felt like she was uh, a little too scandalous. So there's that. There's also the racial issue. We're going to touch on both of those. And I want to take you back to an op-ed uh, for someone who actually saw what was said about Beyonce when she was a part of that Dixie Chicks performance in 2016. I saw Beyonce get booed at the CMAs. I've been waiting for Cowboy uh, Carter. So she says here, let's see. As soon as I heard those horns uh, begin playing and heard Beyonce say the word Texas. I knew that we at the CMAs were in for a real treat of her performing her then hit daddy lessons. Even better, she was performing it with the chicks who I told you guys I know of as the Dixie chicks. The group I grew up thinking was everything. And then I heard a woman in the row ahead of me yell, get that black bee off the stage. Just wanted you to hear that part. Now, Beyonce has responded, and this is what she said, and then I'm gonna show you some other artists in country music that went through similar situations as Beyonce. Beyonce responds to racial criticism of country album as she unveils Cowboy Carter cover. Let me dive in here. And it says, I feel so honored to be the first black woman with the number one single on hot country, so excuse me, hot country songs charts. Uh, however, the Cuffet hit maker noted that the color of her or any other artist's skin should not play a role in whatever genre music they decide to create, potentially referring to excuse me, potentially referencing her country music awards performance in 2016. The singer said the album idea came from a time she did not feel welcome. The star performed her lemonade track, Daddy Lessons, alongside the chicks and was subjected to racist abuse at the time. Because of that experience, I did a deeper dive into the history of country music and studied our rich musical archive. It feels good to see how music can unite so many people around the world while also amplifying the voices of some of the people who have dedicated so much of their lives educating on our musical history. The criticism I have faced when I first entered this genre forced me to propel past the limitations that were put on me. Act two is a result of challenging myself and taking my time to bend and blend genres together to create this body of work. Okay, so that is the response there from Beyonce. I told you there are two issues or two criticisms that people had about Beyonce entering a uh, country music field. One of them was racial and one of them had to do with well, too sexual. <laughs> You're too sexual of a being, you know, her attire. Let's start with the race issue first. It wasn't just her. Kane Brown, who was actually more of a newer country music artist, hip, a little bit more of the edgy newer country sound. I like his music. I think it's pretty bass. He's biracial and he had to experience this in the country music scene. Kane Brown reveals how he dealt with being called racial slurs as a child, it mentions this part here. And this is the interesting part about him. I'm biracial. I did not know that until I was seven or eight years old. I thought I was full white, which honestly, I can't even really say because I didn't see colors. His mother, Tabitha, is white. His dad, who was never in the picture, is black and part Cherokee. So take a look at Kane Brown, right? So obviously, again, Kane is biracial. So let me tell you about some of the things that happened to him when he entered country music. And I think I have to go to click here for more for this one. Yeah, here it is. 
Brown, 25, who launched his career on social media, crooning covers of popular songs and sharing them with his wide network, grew up in Tennessee and Georgia, where country music roots run deep. Brown was heavily influenced by Nashville stars that came before him and took to Facebook and YouTube to share his love for music and grow his fan base on his own. My fans have said they clicked my videos because they thought I was going to be rapping or something. Then I started singing country and they say they just kind of fell in love. What ifs singer told Billboard in a March interview. It goes on to say here, though he has found success in country music industry, Brown is still no stranger to having hateful racial slurs tossed at him on social media. And it goes on to say here, when I first entered a uh, country, I started getting some of these comments like he's an N word, stuff like that. But I didn't get into country music just to prove a point. I try to stay away from all negativity. Now you can call me whatever you want. It just brushes off of me. So again, Kane Brown, who's obviously he's biracial. He received racial slurs when he came into country music. But there's more. Some people forget, but Darius Rucker also went through this experience. Darius Rucker from Hootie and the Blowfish. Remember when Darius decided that he was going to go country? Remember when Dar I said it made sense because he has that sound, right? You know, the Hootie guy, I only want to be with you. Remember? I only want to be with that guy. So Darius Rucker, when he decided to go country, there's Darius there. I want to show you one of the things that he said here, Darius Rucker, and then also Mickey Guyton, more black country artists have been candid about the racism they have faced in the genre. When Rucker made the transition from frontman for the rock band, Hootie and the Blowfish to country superstar, he had to fire back at trolls. After performing at the Grand Old Opry in 2013, a social media user tweeted at Rucker telling him to leave country to the white folk. Tucker is from South Carolina. I said Tucker, Rucker is from South Carolina. Wow, is this 2013 or 1913? I'll take my grand old Opry membership and leave your racism. Wow. Fans then rallied around Rucker and the singer made it clear he had no plans to stop putting out records. Gotta go to bed. This has been a hilarious night. If any haters think I care what you think, I don't make music for you. So don't listen. So that was Darius Rucker. And then there's Mickey uh, Guten. I thought there was one more. That's Kane Brown again, K. Michelle. So you guys can see there's other Charlie Pride, of course, we know. Now we're going to go to the other issue. What's really interesting is that this isn't the first time that Darius Rucker had to go through this. When Darius Rucker was the lead singer of Hootie and the Blowfish, he had talked about this before too. Oftentimes they would book gigs and the band would show up to perform locally. This is before they were famous. They, just, they were just local at that point. They was local. So when they were doing these gigs around South Carolina, you know, everybody was all cool with them. And Darius Rucker said, as soon as he would show up, they would say, whoa, 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 where are you going? And he was like, I'm going to go get on stage. I'm with the band. You know, you're not with the band. Yes, I am the lead singer. I'm Darius Rucker. So they weren't expecting Hooting the Blowfish to have a black singer. I guess he had figured at some point we had moved past that. Country does tend to be a little bit more conservative, even when it comes to the complaints about Beyonce's clothing and her attire and that she's not covered up enough. I want to remind you of someone who was very popular stepping into the country scene, and that is Shania Twain. Some of you may not remember this. I'm old enough to. I'm dating myself. But when Shania Twain first entered the country music scene, she also received backlash from traditional, you know, country music fans. Why are you showing your belly button? Why is this woman wearing these mid drift tops? Raise your hand in the chat if you remember that. Right? 
So this is just a reminder. Shania Twain's risk paid off with any man of mine. Her classic hit reached number one this week in 1995. So that was 1995. A lot of people forget this. This was a big deal because the fact she wore a midriff, right? Are you prepared to watch the shocking video by Shania Twain? Beware. She's frolicking in a field surrounded by horses and wagon wheels. And even though she's wearing jeans and a denim jacket, you can see her belly button. <laughs> yes, the video for any man of mine and Twain's entrance into country music caused some ripples of controversy. Nonetheless, the fans won out and the song became Twain's first number one country hit this week in 1995. How many of you remember this, right? And it goes on to say here, she went on to make several hits, right? So it goes on to say here, Twain's allure was greatly enhanced by her videos, which truly were revolutionary for the time for country music. She was uh, hectored. Yeah, she was hectored at the time of the Any Man of Mine video, which it's belly button barrage for ruining country music by exposing her navel. Shania Twain went on to become a very successful country music artist. So what it goes to show you is that time and time again, country music is more conservative when you compare it to other music genres. It's more conservative than rock and roll. It's more conser conservative than jazz. It's more conservative than blues, more conservative than rap and R&B. It's a whole different thing. Now, does that make the critiques that are done through that genre correct or right? No, it doesn't. I would have thought as years have gone by, things would have started to change. We also have to remember people like Johnny Cash who also received pushback in the country music industry. They thought he was kind of weird. They're like, why is this guy wearing black all the time? They also wanted to cancel Johnny Cash because he was performing at prisons. But I thought that's what the Bible wants you to do though, right? You're supposed to reach out to all, all those that have sinned. Doesn't that include people in prison? They wanted to cancel him. There's been a number of people that have gone through this with country music. I think what has happened with Beyonce is I think this is the first time that Beyonce has received this type of backlash within her career with an album that she has released. And I don't think Beyonce was used to that, but I think she was you know, expecting something to come from it, considering what happened with the performance with the Dixie Chicks, right? But I would like to see country music evolve. I would like to see it be a little bit more welcoming to something a little bit different. Things don't always have to remain the same. Rock and roll has changed throughout the years. Hip hop has changed throughout the years. Jazz has changed throughout the years. And I think country music can have the ability to change as well. Let's all remember it was someone named Taylor Swift that started as a country music singer that actually it was her songs that became very popular that actually got teenage girls to become interested in country music. Never forget that. Jonathan said, add some flavor. <laughs> Jonathan has the tongue sticking out. I don't know, Jonathan. <laughs> uh, let's go to some of the comments here. Oh boy. I don't want to know if I see the chat. Uh, thank you for the super chat, Michael. It's better to go overseas for free college education. I agree with you, Michael. Do that as long as you can before you don't have the opportunity to do so. Janine says, ugh, just because Beyonce is from Texas doesn't make her country. There are other better black country artists than her. Wait a minute, let me say it like this. Hold on, because Janine, this is how I would say, ugh, just because Beyonce is from Texas doesn't make her country. There are better black country artists than her. <laughs> Notori says glad Beyonce did a country song because she is bringing recognition to black girls who are in the country today. Their stocks are going up, but the radio stations are still not playing their music. Thank you, Troy. Most music now is weak due to industry consolidation. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, and thank you for, oh, I said that one already. I think I said that. Okay. 
April says, I am a black woman who has always liked country music. There's an Apple podcast called Color Me Country. I have followed this show for years and have been able to enjoy black country artists. That is good to know, April. Thank you for letting me know about that. And I like like new country. Like I I think I'm one of those people that likes more like the the Keith Urban, like Kane Brown, like you know, the, the more newer style of country music. I, I like that. Uh, thank you, uh, New York Varsity. Thank God for Eminem and Beyonce who murked the concept of staying in your lane. Damn. And thank you for this as well. Kane would have gotten slurred if he did rap. Mixed race people don't always have the best of both worlds. That's a good point there, uh, New York. JB says, navel gate. <laughs> I know it's so funny when you think back on it's like, oh my God, this woman is showing her belly button during that time. Everybody and think about it. Like, you know, all the teen like pop singers were just, that was the midriff thing was a thing. Spice girls were showing their midriff and you know, so, uh, thank you, Courtney Smith. Country music is even more conservative than a lot of current gospel music. Ooh, that's interesting. Courtney. Thank you, Jay. The Pointer Sisters recorded the country song Fairy Tale in 1974 and became the first black group to win a Grammy for best country song. I can only imagine what they went through when they promoted the song. That's interesting. I didn't know that about the Pointer Sisters. I think they had that song called Jump, Jump for Your Love, Jumpin', Feel Your Touch. Da -da -da -da. Okay, anyway, we are moving on to our next story. Oh, God, don't stop me singing. We're moving on to our next story, and we are going to do call-in on Zoom tonight. I think the link is already pinned, but I'll, I'll start it on here before we leave or whatever. This story with RFK Jr. So RFK Jr. apparently had an interview on CNN, and there was a statement that was made, and it was the shock heard around the world. And people took that one little sound bite from RFK, and they are running with it. It's wild and crazy. But I think he really did shock CNN host uh, Aaron, and I don't think she was expecting him to say what he did. And they're trying to use this statement against RFK. Now, listen. I have criticisms for RFK's campaign, uh, but this statement that he made here that everybody is up in arms about is not one of them. Let's go ahead and get started with this clip here. You had to have a VP candidate to get on in some yeah. of these states, right? So that's part of the reason I know you made this decision when you did. The person you've chosen is Nicole Shanahan. Um, she's a lawyer. She doesn't have government experience. Uh, obviously not a household name. And a lot of people have questioned why you picked her. Liz Smith of the DNC just today, um, says she was picked for one reason and one reason only, the money. And obviously she speaks for the DNC, but uh, Mick Mulvaney, who was uh, OMB director under President Trump, said this. There's one thing we need to know about her. It's the reason that uh, Kennedy picked her for vice president. She's fabulously wealthy. This is the woman who single-handedly bankrolled his ad during the Super Bowl that cost $4 million. That's why he put her on the ticket, along with the fact that I think everybody else probably turned him down. Would you have picked her if she didn't have the money? Yeah. Did you see her speech? Part of it. But I, I mean, yeah, I'm just asking, I mean, did you pick? I, mean, I don't think anybody who watched that speech would ever say that. She was you, impressive. She's eloquent. She's authentic. Her life is the, it's the template for the American dream. She started out as a, a minority kid in Oakland, extraordinary poverty, on food stamps, on welfare. She grew up and attended Stanford. Well, she became a Stanford fellow. She became an entrepreneur. She's a very, very uber successful businesswoman. She has an encyclopedic knowledge of AI. She has an encyclopedic knowledge of, of chronic disease epidemic and how to stop it. She is young and she's a mother. And I wanted, in my candidate, I want three things. One, somebody who was not an insider. Some Because it was the insiders who created this problem. They created the debt crisis. They created the addiction to war. They created the chronic disease epidemic. They created the polarization. I wanted somebody outside who's thinking outside of the box. I want to, our campaign is for young people. We are, you know, we're the only campaign that is looking at this assault on our children, on what is happening to 
this young generation. So I wanted somebody who was young, who is not, you know, an 80 year old man. <laughs> so that part was kind of funny. He said someone who was not an 80 year old man. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's obviously he's not going to say, well, yes, it helped that she had a lot of money. Obviously, you know, he's not going to say that, uh, he's right. She is young. Uh, she can appeal to the younger generation. Um, but you know, again, like Kim Iverson was on the show recently and she talked about this, that she didn't approve of this decision either, uh, because she said, it looks like, you know, she basically just bought her way in. And I think a lot of people will, uh, see that, you know? Um, but at the same time, I mean, CNN really can't complain about a presidential candidate picking someone who has money because you guys are always telling us to vote for people who take a lot of corporate donor money anyway. So <laughs> Aaron really doesn't have room to talk there. That part was funny. I wanted somebody who's a mother. I wanted somebody who's going to champion their issues. And, if I, and I don't think anybody who looked at Nicole Shanahan's speech which I urge people to do, would ever say that the reason that I picked her was for her money. By the way, we don't need her money to get on the ballot in every state. We already have the biggest field operation of any campaign. We are going to have no problem getting on the ballot in every state. We did not need Nicole Shanahan's money, and we're getting plenty of money. We're raising more money. Our campaign is. And President Trump or President Biden. Well, so when, when you... So Nicole, girl, Paige and Nicole... You can get that money back. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> he said, we don't need our money. Talk about, though, that you say that you're pulling equally from both. And we'll see what happens. But in the polling that we uh, have, I, but hold on one second. You, it, it, I'm going to just take Georgia because we all know okay. Georgia margin of victory yeah. last time was 11,779 votes. So the latest polling from Georgia, you get 12% of the Democratic vote. You pull 5% of the Republican vote. Again, these are polls, this is where we are right now, but that's that's when they, that's when what they show. So when you look at it that way, how can you say that your campaign is not taking more uh, from what Biden? I, what I would say to you, and you know, um, I, I'm not, this isn't something I wanna argue with you about, it's just what I'm, my observation is, and I don't care one way or the other, what, what my observation is of the Quinnipiac poll, the Harvard-Harris poll, the Gallup poll, the New York Times, the poll, all the leading national polls at this point in history as of today show me polling like maybe two more points from President Trump than I am from President Biden. So I, mainly what they're, what they're showing, and the Politico did a big article on this, is my supporters are people who aren't going to vote at all, largely, and my donors are people who had given up on the American political process and are re-engaging because... They feel that they don't want to choose between the lesser of two evils. They want to choose a candidate who is going to inspire them, who's going to give them hope, who has a vision for the future, and who has the vigor and energy to actually change this country. And that, you know, those, those, I want to engage those people in the political process. The Pause for a second. I've heard people say both. I've heard uh, people say that they supported Trump last time, and this time they're supporting RFK. And I've heard people say they supported Biden last time and this time they're supporting RFK. So I've actually heard both. And I've also heard people say they're going to support RFK just because they don't want to vote for either one of the two parties or whatever. But to be fair, I have heard people from both sides uh, say that they are supporting him. But the thing is here is what Aaron was basically trying to do with this interview is that she is trying to basically prove to people that if. Donald Trump wins in November, it is going to be because of RFK Jr. They're already prepping the press for this. They're already getting the narrative ready. Uh, that's why they're having these interviews. Remember, he hasn't been on CNN since I think he first announced. Uh, so it's been a while. That's why he's constantly been on Fox News because they don't want to bring him on CNN, but apparently here he is now. Uh, but they're already trying to set the stage for this. I'm telling you guys, they always try to blame someone, right? Just like in 2016, Hillary, Hillary's camp blamed the Bernie Sanders supporters, even though Bernie tried to help Hillary get elected. You know, it's, it's crazy. So I'm already calling it now. If Donald Trump wins in November, they're going to blame RFK Jr. And then they're also going to blame, depending on what happens with Jill Stein, Cornell West, 
uh, Claudia de la Cruz, they're also going to blame them too. But I think more of the attack will be on RFK Jr. And I think the only reason why they have him on CNN right now, although they've been ignoring him all this time, is because of the person that he picked for VP, because they know that his pick, Nicole Shanahan, who did identify herself as a progressive and has donated to Democrat candidates, actually could really hurt Joe Biden and pull people away from Biden. Democrats and Republicans, I'm going to take from the margins. And I can't tell you, even today, it's irrelevant, Aaron, because it's really, what, who am I going to take from in November? So you, in, in 2000, um, Ralph Nader obviously was running and you did an interview with NBC News just a few months before the election. You said this. There's a political reality here, which is that his candidacy could draw enough votes in certain key states from Al Gore to give the entire election to George W. Bush. Okay, guys, they went back. They did that moment. They went back there and they got this statement from RFK Jr. against, um, oh shoot, what's his name? Ralph Nader. Remember when Ralph Nader ran? It was Ralph Nader, uh, Al Gore, and uh, George W. Bush. Yes, I'm sorry, getting my years mixed up. But those three that ran against each other, they went back and they pulled this because basically they're going to try to throw this in his face and say, well, aren't you technically the spoiler now? Watch this. And then you wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. You wrote, Ralph Nader is my friend and hero, but Mr. Nader's candidacy could siphon votes from Al Gore. Mr. Nader dismisses his spoiler role by arguing there is little distinction between the major party candidates and that Mr. Gore is compromised on too many issues. While I admire his high-minded ideals, his suggestion that there is no difference between Mr. Gore and Mr. Bush is irresponsible. A moment ago, you said you you essentially see Trump and Biden as the same, different, different issues. But do you really believe that? When people talk about the threat to democracy that Trump poses, do you really think that that is, is, is an equal yeah, evil I mean, no, to Biden? Let me pause. So you see what she did there? Notice she brought up how he criticized uh, any third party or independent run during that time, the video footage that they showed you, right? But what she didn't in turn do was say, well, you're basically doing the same thing now. She switched the conversation to democracy. And this is basically the call heard around the world that freaked people out. And several outlets took his statement here and they just kind of ran with it. I, I, I mean, listen, I can make the argument that uh, President Biden is a much worse threat to democracy. And the reason for that is President Biden is the first candidate in history, the first president in history that has used the federal agencies to censor political speech, so to censor his opponent. I, you know, I can say that because I just won a case in the Federal Court of Appeals and now before the Supreme Court. It shows that he started censoring not just me. 37 hours after he took the oath of office, he was censoring me. No president in the country has ever done that. The greatest threat to democracy is not somebody who questions election returns, but a president of the United States who used the power of his office to force the social media companies, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, to open a portal and give the access to that portal to the FBI, to the CIA, to the IRS, to CISA, to NIH, to censor his political critics. President Biden, for the first, first president in history, to use the secret, his power over the Secret Service, to deny Secret Service protection to one of his political opponents for political reasons. He's weaponizing the federal agencies. Those are really critical threats Donald to democracy. Donald Trump, of course, tried to overturn a free and fair election. He tried to overturn one, right? He's, he's still fighting in court. Yes. He's a, how... Okay, so Aaron, if anything, basically what you're telling us is they're both just as corrupt. You know, like that doesn't help your case there, Aaron. When she chimes in and says, well, Donald Trump tried to do this after everything that he told you that has happened under Joe Biden's uh, presidency, the censorship of the tech platforms, the Twitter files, everything that was revealed there happening under the Biden administration, also Facebook, the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story, uh, all these things that have come out that have happened under Joe Biden's administration. Now, he may not have been the one to pull the trigger, but he also wasn't the one to try to dial it back either. He wasn't the one to tell them to stop doing it. He knew these things were happening. 
So think about that. So Aaron comes in and says, well, Donald Trump tried to do this. Okay, Aaron. So you're basically proving what I've been saying for quite some time. Both of them are equally corrupt. You know, it just, I, I don't know where she was going with this. Is that not a threat to democracy? Well, I think that is a threat to democracy. If he, yeah, him overthrow, trying to overthrow the election clearly is a threat to democracy. But the, the question was, who is a worse threat to democracy? And what I would say is, I, you know, I'm not going to answer that question, but I can argue that President Biden is because the First Amendment, Aaron, is the most important. Adams and Hamilton and Madison said, we put the guarantee of freedom of expression in the First Amendment because all of our other constitutional so, rights depend on it. If you have a government that can silence its opponents, it has license for any atrocity. So it, just to be clear, you're saying you could make an argument that President Biden is a worse threat to democracy than, than Donald Trump. Absolutely. That's what you just said. But who else has so, ever tried to, who else has ever tried to send, what president in history mm -hmm. has ever tried to censor political opponents? What president has weaponized the federal agency? You know, when my father... Pause before he gets to his father. You see what she did? So she got the sound bite that she needed. And some people, they actually have, again, I have my criticism of RFK, but if you're going to quote someone, quote them correctly. Some people took that little sound bite and they put it out on Twitter and left all the context out of the, out of the discussion. Right? So you don't do that. That's not ethical journalism. So that's what this interview was all about. So then they could take that sound bite and all of these other news outlets can take that little quote from RFJ, RFK Jr. there and say, RFK Jr. admits he's trying to help Donald Trump. That would be the headline, right? That They like to spin shit. <laughs> That's how they get people. Oh, that headline. What? He actually said that? You click on it. You read it. And you're like, oh, he said no context whatsoever about... Um, when she said, well, Donald Trump did this when she, the way that she pushed back on him again, I just, again, I don't understand Aaron. Why are you telling him what Donald Trump did? He is not Donald Trump's running mate. He is running against both of them. This is what kills me with these journalists that are interviewing third party and independent candidates. And they're basically saying to them, well, you know, Trump did this and he did that, right? Okay. But as a third party independent candidate, you're running against Joe Biden and Donald Trump. You're not just running against Joe Biden. I mean, this is it's basic common sense, basic common sense. But I want to show you something and then we'll get to his response on News Nation. I want to show you something else because it's not just Joe Biden. It wasn't just Joe Biden that meddled within the media and censorship. Check this out. Two people in particular I want to point out, Woodrow Wilson and Richard Nixon. President feuds with the media are nothing new. Let's dive into Woodrow. Some of the other ones are a little bit more da-da-da. Woodrow Wilson. All right. Listen to his situation. Woodrow Wilson is perhaps best known for helming the U.S. through the Great War and being an integral part of the peace process, earning him a Nobel Prize for his efforts. What may be less known is that during the U.S. involvement in World War I, Wilson curtailed freedom of the press. He did this through a dual strategy of censorship and propaganda. Woodrow Wilson. So before there was Joe Biden trying to control these social media platforms, back before the day of social media, you had Woodrow Wilson also practicing censorship and propaganda in reference to the press. Interesting, huh? And let's go to Richard Nixon. I think I went to, whoopsie, I don't know what happened there. Let's dive down to Richard Nixon. Let's go to him. Let's see what he did in reference to censorship and the press. Listen to this. Richard Nixon's experience with the press during his campaign against JFK, mainly his perceived loss in their televised 1960 debate, made him acutely aware of the media's power. As a result, he entered office determined to control his media coverage. He created the White House Office of Communications and hired a strategist to help him improve his television appearances. That strategist 
future Fox News CEO, Roger Ailes. However, not all of this work helped assuage Nixon's fears that the press was against him. Listen to this part here. Driven by paranoia and the embarrassing revelations of his role in the Watergate scandal, Nixon compiled a list of press enemies and had them audited. His surrogates even mounted a campaign to yank the license of a television station owned by the Washington Post, which broke the Watergate scandal and published parts of the Pentagon Papers. What? It's been happening before Joe Biden, before Joe Biden. RFK Jr. did respond uh, to the pushback that he's receiving since that interview with CNN. Again, I told you Aaron did that as a gotcha moment. He was on News Nation. Listen to his response here. So the headlines read, Bobby Kennedy thinks Biden bigger threat than Trump. Is that fair? Robert F. Kennedy Jr. here is to make the case for himself. I told you to be careful what you wish for. Um, here's one thing we know for sure. The Biden administration is not giving you security today, not after that interview. Do you want people to believe that you think that President Biden has done more objectionable things vis-a-vis -vis our democracy than former President Trump did in the aftermath of the last election? No, I, as you heard, Chris, I... What I said was that I can make this argument, and I didn't say definitively whether I believed one or the other was more dangerous than democracy. I did say that I don't believe either of them are going to destroy democracy. Both sides are telling us the other guy is the end of the republic. But, you know, they, they're both lame duck presidents. They're going to be in there four years. Like their, their, their opponent, political opponents are going to be announced two years later. There'll be a new Congress in two years later, and we, ha we have strong institutions in our country. We have judiciary, we have the press to some extent, we've got Congress, and you have the military, you've got a lot of institutions that, that are bulwarks against a you know, tyrant coming in and taking over democracy. So I don't think that's gonna happen. I think we're, both, we're all being told each one is, uh, is a threat because it, it's a way of using fear to force us into a binary choice where we're forced into the canal, into this channel that nobody wants to go to, where we either have to vote for, we have to vote for the lesser of two evils, and nobody wants to do that. But it keeps them from, you know, it, it keeps a lot of the public from considering people like me that have much, I have a much higher popularity rating than either of these candidates. I, so more people would rather see me in office than, presumably, than either of them. Uh, but they are not going to vote for me because the, you know, the media and this whole sort of cartel from both sides is telling them, oh, you have to choose between these two guys. The other guy is so scary. Now, the point I made last night and the way I'm very grateful, by the way, to Aaron Burnett, as you know, CNN has not let me on for a live interview in a decade. And she did that. She was very, very courageous. She gave me a very fair interview. I was really dumbfounded about how fair it was. Pause. So, and thank you so much for saying this, Tory. Love or hate Donald Trump, he's going to tell you what he think about somebody. Robert is a flip flopping boop. Yeah. So let's talk about this for just a second. So this is one of the things I have noticed about RFK. I notice he tends to back down when he's pushed or questioned about something. He tends to back down. He just backed down from this debate with Jill Stein, by the way. I don't know if you guys follow Jill Stein on Twitter, but if you look at her tweets, okay, you look at her tweets, she tells you that they spoke with his campaign and he decided not to engage in having a debate with Jill Stein. I think that is a colossal mistake, by the way. Huge. Now, that being said, and here he is giving credit to Aaron for doing the interview with him. This isn't Aaron like going out of her way to do this interview. This is Aaron doing what she was told to do. Aaron is just doing her job. 
This would not happen if the network execs actually didn't want RFK on there. He would not be on there, just period. So it's not like Aaron running things around there. Aaron sit at that desk. She fiddled through those little papers. <laughs> <laughs> you guys ever notice how like the commentators, they all got that little stack of papers. Look, she got the papers right there. Look, see the little papers that they fiddle through, right? And they fiddle through the papers to make it seem like they did research or something. They didn't research that stuff. All they do is read what is put in front of them. Sage Steele right now has a video trending on Twitter of her saying that the interview that she had with President Joe Biden was scripted. She said it all was scripted. Nothing was what she thought or what she felt or what she believed. This is all an act. So there's no need for you to give kudos to Aaron. Aaron is just doing what she paid to do. And if it was something that they didn't want to happen, Aaron would not be sitting in that seat. She pushed back on me a lot and she doesn't agree with me, obviously, on stuff. But she actually let me speak, which was I'm grateful for when CNN Digital got it. They cut my quote so it looked like I was making this definitive statement that Biden was more of a threat to democracy than Trump. And of course, I never said that, but that's a way of making me look crazy to the liberals. Here's the point I didn't make, and I think it's a really important point, is that you have one president who allegedly hasn't been convicted, but allegedly was trying to overthrow an election illegally, which of course is horrible for democracy. You had another president who actually is, has censored speech and there's courts that have found that he censored speech. And have you guys noticed he wearing the same outfit? So that going to show you, check this out. He was wearing the same, is that the same suit jacket? Is that a different suit? It looks like it's the same outfit. Maybe the jacket changed, but the tie looks the same and the shirt looks the same. So it's almost as if he did these interviews the same day. Maybe he did, right? Okay, sorry about that. Has censored speech, and there's courts that have found that he censored speech and have enjoined him from doing it again. So there's actually a court judgment against President Biden, and one of the cases is Biden versus Kennedy, which is my case. The other is Murthy versus Biden, which was just heard the arguments by the United States Supreme Court. But what those cases show is that 37 hours after he took the oath of office, High White House officials were meeting with the social media companies, with uh, with YouTube, Facebook, Google, Instagram, and Twitter, and ordering them to censor President Biden's political opponents. And it was on a lot of it was on health, public health, COVID, et cetera. But also there were other things were being censored, like criticism of his Ukraine policy, and actually. Criticism right. of a kind of a satire of him and, and, and Jill Biden. The danger in this is that what the White House was saying, the leverage the White House had was it was saying, if you don't do that, we're going to bring antitrust cases against you and we are going to revoke your Section 230 immunity, which is existential right. for those, co co those companies. A Section 230 is the section that protects them against defamation suits for for publishing defamatory statements by you know if you or i put up a def defamation against somebody that right. person can't can sue us but they can't sue, sue youtube oh they can't exist right. without that or they'd have to vet every single post with a lawyer so it was existential threat and the the social media companies then went ahead and censored us the way they did it is they provided a portal and President Biden gave access to that portal to about a dozen agencies, including the CIA, the FBI, CISA, the IRS, NIH, and other agencies, DHS, to censor, to remove people or to remove particular posts. Now, the reason this is should be concerning to Democrats as well is once that precedent is established, you know, Joe Biden, everybody, all the Democrats feel he's such a nice guy. He'd never do anything really malicious. But once you establish that precedent, the next president, whoever he is, even President Trump, now has that power at his fingertips. And he it's true. Yeah. And the thing is, is, and I agree in reference to the censorship of social media. I'm tired of it. I think it's ridiculous. I think it is government overreach. I 100% agree. Um, 
That being said, though, it felt like in this interview with Chris Cuomo, it felt like RFK backed down a little bit and you shouldn't because he shouldn't, because this is what they're saying about him. Okay. They are really saying some crazy stuff over at Morning Joe. And this is why I say RFK Jr. should be going harder than what he's going right now. That's why I said, I don't trust that he's anti-establishment. I told you, I don't think he's anti-war. How are you anti-war and you tweeting, give Israel everything, the weapons and everything that it needs. So you're not anti-war, right? So we've talked about this before. So to me, <clears throat> it is very noticeable that I see him just try to back back away a little bit anytime he gets pressure it's not just this example there have been a number of examples that have happened where he's like well what i really meant was no nah, you meant what you said <laughs> you meant exactly what you said don't like cower from that stand up and and say yeah that's what i said and i meant it damn it and just keep it as it is because this is what they're actually saying about they're actually saying they're trying to relate this to martin luther king jr they're basically trying to say RFK's candidacy is disgracing Martin Luther King Jr. Listen I note to this. here uh, on how has changed and how Donald Trump has worked to reverse so many of the gains uh, made um, since Martin Luther King's passing. Um, we showed that extraordinary clip of Bobby Kennedy and here we are, 56 years later, a guy we both know, Bobby Kennedy Jr., running, you know, as basically cover for Donald Trump. Uh, it's not a coincidence that some of Bobby Kennedy Jr.'s biggest contributors are Donald Trump's biggest contributors. So here we are all these years later, and it, it just this twisted path has led us to where somebody named Kennedy is putting himself in a position to elect Donald Trump president, a guy who whose life now is dedicated to reversing the work of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. So a couple of things. First of all, how the hell you spin the web that you just spun to put that together? <laughs> Look, you can have your criticism of RFK, but to blame him and say that, well, he's basically trying to put someone in office who's trying to get rid of the legacy of MLK. Now you're trying to make this weird connection to MLK that actually is irrelevant. Now, if you're going to criticize RFK in reference to MLK, you can criticize the comment that he made when he said that his father actually, you know, had to do the wiretap on MLK, yada, yada. Criticize him for that shit. But the thing is, look at how look at how far they're willing to go because they know, according to the polls, they he is a threat. Tomorrow night, we're going to go through the map. We're going to go through the electoral map tomorrow night. I'm going to show you what I think is going to happen. It's interactive so we can play. But I'm going to show you what I think is going to happen because this is why they're putting these things out against him, especially now he picked the person that he picked for VP. So there's that too. And two, what kills me is for the morning Joe couple here, okay, you know, just, just stop. You know, they kill me like all of a sudden they try to pretend like they care about black people. Stop it. Just no. Just stop because any other time black people have come on that show and they have tried to make the case for the Democratic Party is not doing things for us. All you've done is try to make them look like a fucking loony bin. So stop it with it. Stop pretending like, you, 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 oh, I care about all oh, the legacy of Dr. King. Just stop. When you leave the studio at night and you go back to your million dollar penthouse, you ain't thinking about no damn MLK. You ain't thinking about his damn legacy. You thinking about the money that you make from that show and how you are living just as comfortable as can be because the connections that you made and the narrative that you spin from the State Department. So don't even get out of here. They kill me. Because if you really cared that much about MLK's legacy, you would actually listen to what black voters are telling you when they come onto your show and they tell you that black voters are tired of the Democratic Party and that, yes, the party is not doing anything for us. You wouldn't sit up there and try to smear them. It's clown shit.
They're the white moderate. They're the ones that MLK warned you about. That couple on Morning Joe. We will do call in tonight, uh, but we're going to do it on Zoom. It should be pinned to the top of the chat. I'm going to take a quick break and we'll be back and we'll dive in and I'll explain how to do it. We're going to be doing it live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So this is the part of our show where Savvy gets a little break before we jump into the call in. And like she said, we're going to be, we're going to be doing it the new way. I, I think we should, I, I like to call it uh, the Savvy Hangout on Zoom. Maybe we'll call it that. We'll see what we're calling it. Um, uh, but yeah, we'll uh, uh, just uh, have patience with us. This is the first time we're doing it this way, and uh, we'll, I'm sure it'll work out fairly well, but uh, but something new. Um, but what we do have is a lot of chats that came in. Let's see. Let's start with this uh, uh, Rumble rant. We try to uh, take care of our peeps out there on Rumble. Uh, thanks for this one. I think that's Jewel. Joel. Uh, check out You Can Have Him, Jolene, by Chapel Heart. So great, Dolly loved it too. Thanks for that one, Joel, out on the Rumble. And we got some uh, chats. And uh, yeah, so we'll be um, uh, the Zoom link, I believe, uh, Sabrina pinned to the chat. And uh, don't worry about jumping in there right away. I mean, you can, um, we'll, we'll kind of, I think we'll kind of figure this out live and um, <laughs> we'll get there. Um, but yeah, like when Savvy comes back, we'll figure out the Zoom and the call in and we'll make it work. But in the meantime, I have some chats to call to, uh, to, to uh, read out here. Uh, let's see. Uh, thanks for this super sticker. Stop sniffing kids, Joe. Uh, when are you going to talk about Garland for Rito? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but thanks for the uh, super chat. And thanks for this one, NY Varsity Sports. The difference between her and Kamala or Pence, and the uh, okay, so this would be talking about uh, Nicole Shanahan being picked for VP. The difference between her and Kamala or Pence is that she had money and is bright as F. Every year we complain that out of all the bright minds, we can't do better than Biden, Trump. And now that we have one, she's what, rich? Well, um, we'll see if, um, I know we've seen in NYVR City Sports sometimes in the call-in. So, um, so we'll see if um, uh, he wants to uh, come over to the new call-in to uh, discuss that. Um, to me, the the problem is, well, it is part that she's rich, I, I, I think, um, I think billionaires are just, it's just too much money in, in too few hands. But the biggest problem I have is, is just the corruption. You know, she's just another player in a corrupt system is, is what I see when I look at, at someone like Nicole Shanahan. Um, thanks for the super chat. Oh, and thanks for that super chat. Uh, NY varsity sports. I want to make sure we say that. Um, uh, thanks for this one. Troy Perone. Sabby, I respect your criticism of RFK Jr his views on how the country is keeping a sick sold me continue criticism. His stance on Israel is trash. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, for me, you know, uh, killing thousands of children or, you know, being in support of that is a red line for me. <laughs> and I would think it would be a red line for anyone of conscience, but, uh, you do, you, uh, RFK supporters. Uh, and, uh, thanks also for this one in my varsity sports. My conspiracy theory, generate enough money so he can give Shmuley the finger. He's doing headcount on how many Israel supporters he would lose versus voters he would gain. Money in politics is real. Thanks for that one. Um, yeah, David came in with this one. Uh, uh, I wonder if Cuomo is wearing his stained shirt under that suit. Um, calling back to the um, uh, uh, to the uh, Cuomo, I don't know what you'd call that, a video he did before with his stained shirt. Um, but uh, yeah, and let's see. Oh yeah, JB was talking about the suit. What day was that interview? We got the same suit, at least changed the tie. And um, so many of the chats that it's uh, the rich people's uniform, you know. <laughs> uh, thanks for the super chat. Leprechaun Alley, Joe's version of conspiracy theories. It sounds like a six-year-old made it up. <laughs> thanks for that. Um, and let's see. Uh, 
And thanks for this super chat, Michael Pan. Red, do you support cash payment reparations ADOS? Um, thanks for that, whatever it was. And uh, and JB uh, also had uh, this one, which I liked. Um, what the F is Joe talking about? Biden has some of the same donors as Trump to uh, Biden helping Trump. I'd say yes. And, you know, what, what that made me think of is just um, in terms of kind of the whole, it makes me think about like, like, Trump's best asset has basically always been Biden, right? Because, you know, Biden just being so bad and, and ridiculous and has gotten worse than ever, you know, drives people to Trump. And, of course, Trump being Trump, you know, drives people to Biden. Of course, that's the game they want. Um, it kind of feels like uh, RFK Jr. is hoping that um, both Biden and Trump being terrible will drive people his way. Um, which is possible, you know. I I hope it um, it drives people into the arms of a, a candidate who's really non corrupt and really um, will um, will have an eye on, on fixing things. Um, the um, I noticed um, I I have noticed too on um, on Twitter um, uh, Jill Stein challenging RFK to a debate. Um, I remember there there was a while back where people were kind of there were some people on Twitter at um, at kind of poking at the Stein campaign, saying, "Why aren't you talking more about RFK?" And um, but I, I so I, I think they heard you, <laughs> and and, uh, and I think it's a good play, you know, to challenge him. And you know, I, I think I think Jill could um, could kind of embarrass RFK Jr. in a debate, frankly. But it'd, it'd be interesting to see. Um, let's see. Um, and thanks for the super chat, Troy Perone. It's all one big club. Yes, well said on that one. All right. Is it time to try to do I this think, thing? Yeah, Eric, I think he was asking you. I think, Michael, that he was asking you when he said red. Eric T. Red. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. They could catch then. <laughs> I know yeah, what he meant. Yeah, well, well, the answer is if, if anyone who's seen what I've talked about or, or written up will know the answer to that is a strong yes, and that um, I think it should be viewed as what it is a debt owed. I've talked about or, or written up will know the answer to that is a strong yes. Hey, that's me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to queue up the thing for Zoom. Okay, we're going to do this on Zoom, um, but I want to go ahead and start it on here, right? just to make sure. So if you guys look at the live chat right now, there's a comment pinned to the live chat. Eric, if you want to show it to people, if you can, but it says savvy after dark call in show will start after the stream on zoom and there's the zoom link. So you click on the link right next to the link is the passcode, which I'm going to put up here so everybody can see it because it wouldn't let me remove the passcode option. I don't know why, but that's, um, the ad really needed, but it doesn't hurt to put it on there. No, they, they do need it, I think. Um, I got in without it. You did? Okay, well, I'll put it up here we'll see. just in case um, on the screen. So that's the passcode, 675324. All right, let me go ahead and I'll open the Zoom. I'm going to stay on here <laughs> till I open it just to make sure that people can get in. Because if you try to get in right now, it's probably going to say uh, waiting for the host to start. So I just started it. And it says, um, okay, it is open. Oh, there's already 34 people here. Names. <laughs> okay, Eric, are you in? Yes. Yep. I see you and I'm going to make you, it doesn't allow me to make you a co-host. It allows me to make you a host. Um, but that may take away you as a host. This yeah. So I'll just, I should be fine. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I've never had any problems getting kicked out of Zoom ever. Um, oh, and I'll say I, I don't know what's our thing on video. Are we saying like video optional? My video was off. I know, but just in general. Yeah, video's optional. Like just like I call in. Mine on, I'm on twice. <laughs> okay, if you can mute yourself on call in real quick. Base oh, and then. What people should are sorry on Zoom and what people should see is Zoom, um, yeah. OK, so what people should see is in Zoom. I think most of you use Zoom, but in Zoom um, towards the bottom of the the bottom of the screen, you'll see unmute or mute start video. If you don't want to do that, participants chat. So there is a chat. You guys can still chat with each other. And then there's reactions. 
if you click on reactions, there's a little emoji to raise your hand. So it says raise hand. So I'm actually just raised my hand on Zoom. So if you um, look up to my picture, you'll see, see that little yellow, my hand is raised, although my hand doesn't need to be raised. And when you want to take your Why hand you down, you just click back. When you want to take your hand down, you will just um, go back to that reaction and you click lower hand, right? So if you want to speak, just um, raise your hand. Okay, so I can see, and I can see all you guys, all the participants. So I see David has his hand raised. Okay, so <laughs> David looks like you're going to speak first. And I think what you're going to need to do is once you exit StreamYard is then enable, or I don't know, how are you, are you going to run it from there? Or are you going to try to use your, the mic you're using now or do it differently? No, I, I can do this. Oh, okay, good. You're up yeah. right. You're all set then. All right. Yeah, and, and I just no, want to make sure I'm needed. Okay. Do this and that. On so that uh, uh, it'll leak more bandwidth for whoever is talking. Yeah, if I've seen you move your mouse a few times, but I'm not hearing anything because you are muted. Yeah, let me oh, just say no, everybody no. on here and on Zoom, if you're not talking, just make sure you mute your mic so we don't get feedback. Okay, but it looks like everybody got in. Let me see. Hey, say something on Zoom. Test, test. I think everybody else can hear me. Can you guys hear me in the chat? Okay, um, Rod, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you, Sabi. Okay, they can hear me, Eric. All right. All right, so. All right, I guess we'll jump over. All right, I'll take this number <laughs> down because somebody's probably like, what does that mean? All right, yeah, so that's the passcode again, and if you still need it. Other than that, guys, you know how we do this. Have a good All right, night. That was smooth. <laughs> it's so much easier than calling. Have a good Be night. Keep up the fight. Thank you.